703, I'll call to order this meeting of the Waterbury Select Board on Monday, the 20th of May, 2024. And we're ready to go. First item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Do I have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. Okay. I have a motion to approve. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Moving seconded. Discussion. Uh, do we have an entertainment permit from Robert Owen that we're adding at 8.30 yep. p.m.? Yes. Right. How about right after Arts Fest? Yeah. At approximately 8.30. And then another change. I have a motion to uh, make those two amendments. So we have a motion to. Uh, uh, we got a motion. You can second it. Second. Sorry. Okay. Any discussion on the amendments? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Now we are voting on the uh, agenda as amended. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. The agenda is approved as amended. <coughs> Next, we have the consent agenda. Do I have a motion? I move to approve the consent agenda as written. Do I have a second? Second. Moved and seconded. And all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Consent agenda is approved as written. Next, we have the public session. Anyone wishing to address the uh, folks? Yeah, I'll get to you in a second. Let me just finish my explanation. Anyone wishing to uh, address anything not on the warned agenda, please come forward and uh, contain yourself uh, to three minutes if you can. Uh, just noting that uh, both the, bylaw, the bylaws and the uh, rental property ordinance are on the warrant agenda. So we'll be taking those up next. It's not. Yeah, go ahead, Kat. Okay. Um, I just forward. recently learned that Mary Cohn um, is no longer on the planning commission and she served for 12 years and maybe I missed it, but I didn't see where the select board or anybody acknowledged that and although you not, didn't always agree, <laughs> I felt like she listened and uh, I think to be applauded to spend that much time for that. So I don't know. Thank you. I did privately thank Mary for her That's service, good. but uh, we did not do it. Uh, so I wanted to say as part of the Park Steering Committee, uh, happy to announce today that we put 120 trees and shrubs uh, along the Thatcher Brook in Hope Davy Park. And I want to thank a lot of people. Um, it was a lot of fun. Uh, and now we can enlist some help pulling out some of the uh, invasive species, because there's a lot. But first of all, um, I want to thank Friends of the Nooski that got funding for it and wound up getting all of the trees to do that. They also uh, elicited a group, Project Harmony out of Waitsfield, that does cultural exchanges. We had something like 15, 18 students from Myanmar uh, digging holes all over and helping us plant. And I also really want to thank um, uh, Katerina from the rec department who helped us put all of this together. It was really great. So uh, that's the, one of the parts of the Park Steering Committee. And I'm really excited by the fact that we're going to try to protect that riverbank, that, that road. So, and thanks for the select word support on all of that, because you guys passed the, uh, the plan. Thanks. Any other public comments? Anyone up uh, online have anything to say in the public session? No. All right, let's move on uh, to the bylaw update public hearing. This is a continuation of the hearing that we uh, started back on May 6th uh, during the select board meeting uh, for testimony. Uh, and so we will just continue that hearing now. Uh, anyone that we wishing to make a comment, please raise your hand. Yeah, Alec, come forward, please. Uh, 
my wife and I live in uh, I, I don't know what uh, to call this. Place. My name's Alec Tuscany. Uh, I'm not I'm currently the part-time town engineer, but I'm not up here on town engineering business. Uh, my wife and I live at 86 South Main Street, which is next to the park. Um, the house is built 1854, and until the mid-1980s, it was a single-family residence. In fact, my wife's grandmother raised her family in that house. Um, until two years ago, it was a two-apartment house. My wife and I live on the ground floor. Our tenant lives on the second floor. A couple of years ago, we did put in an efficiency apartment on the second floor of our garage. So in talking to the zoning office, I asked, well, what if, oh, let me back up. One um, benefit of that house is, especially on the second floor, there's a lot of rooms for um, other bedrooms if, if it was a single family house. Okay. So I asked the zoning if someone's to come by and offer to buy, not that we're interested in selling at the moment, but had a large family and could utilize the multiple rooms for bedrooms. And they indicated to me, um, well, since you built that accessory dwelling unit over your garage, you can. And I said, well, what if we hadn't? Mm -hmm. Well, then you can't. Um, and I just, <coughs> I'm concerned our house and a lot of other houses down Main Street, South Main Street, and North Main Street are historical in nature. Uh, the village Main Street is historic. Um, and I just, I'm not sure what your uh, bylaws are trying to create relative to multiple dwellings or additional dwellings. And I don't argue we need it. Um, but I read an article in seven days talking about Winooski and their housing uh, efforts over the past many years. And one of the issues they raised in the article was a lot of apartments have been built. And if you've been through Winooski, Main Street, or East Allen, a lot of them are right on the edge of the sidewalk, multi-story. But one of the comments in the article was that families with many kids, they couldn't find apartments in all the new apartments being built. They were either single bedroom or two bedroom, which really doesn't accommodate you know, a family with lots of kids. So all I'm asking is, um, granted, right at the moment, it doesn't affect us, but if we hadn't built that unit, it could have, and someone came by and wanted to make use of our house for a large family. And I'm not sure how many other houses on North or South Main might, could be in that situation. And was that at least given consideration? Um, mm -hmm. That, you know, there, are, there could be some families that need multiple bedrooms. Right? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I said this last week, but I just wanted to reiterate it, is that we have two rentals, and um, they now are both two units, but at one point, our Liel house was one family. Actually, Steve Lotchby lived there with his three kids when he first moved to town here. Couldn't find another place for a family. The Bosnian family of seven lived in our house when they first moved here because they didn't have another place to live. And I'm just concerned that we are not having enough options for other people. It's not all about one or two bedroom homes. In fact, with so many people working from home, I get people who look at our two bedroom and they want three because two, they both work from home. So now everybody needs an office. And if you look around town, we have a lot of commercial space that's still for rent because people aren't doing offices outside their home anymore. So I wanted, I wanted to say that. And again, I just picked my son up from the airport today coming home from Namibia, and I have no place for him to live unless my two tenants who were in one of our houses 
move out when their lease is up in the fall, and we can turn our brick house back into a single family home because he has three girls, himself and partner. So I just think we need more options and it doesn't seem fair that those of us who have invested in our homes all these years don't get to do what we had intended to. And not to be a little frank, <laughs> I guess, I, when we merged, the village and the town merged, mm -hmm. I'm thinking, okay, that's probably a good thing, you know, everybody gets some police. But lately, I've kind of really felt like maybe that wasn't a good thing. Because it used to be, we were a village, we were the historical village, people, you know, I can think of 12 people who served on select boards or boards or for multiple years, 20, 25 years. My husband's been a fireman for 50, 60 years. And those pe people, if we're just creating apartments for people to come and go until they can buy a single family home <coughs> outside of the village or somewhere else, where's all that commitment gonna be? And so I just really would um, hope that you would not um, forego anybody making a decision about their own house, whether they own a single family home and want to sell it as a single family home, or they own a duplex and want to turn it into a single family home. It, it should be their choice. And then I left this meeting asking you guys a question. I don't know if it got answered. I still don't know why the mixed use of South Main Street, North Main Street, Park Grove, Bachelor Street, all of which are in a floodplain, are talking about have to be multi-unit housing, but then the other streets, they can have multi-unit housing if they want to, but they can also have single family housing if they want to. Mm -hmm. What makes our street, our area, the one that you chose to do that for? Because Bachelor Street does not have a commercial thing on it. I've got commercial stuff next to us, but nothing in the middle. And North Main has you know, got some things down there too. There's nothing on, um, I mean, there, we've got the shopping area, but Park Road, Park, my son has a house on Park Road, I never even mix them up. But you know, they might have something adjacent to them, but what makes it beautiful and not stodgy is the fact that we do have some beautiful homes there. Right. I mean, I just feel like over the years, I've really been let down by zoning. You know, if I live across from Napa, the rules were broken there. I had a big flashing neon light because the building got two stories high when it was only supposed to be one because they allowed parking on the street. We allowed, we changed the zoning laws so Ed Steele could then keep his dirt in there after the fact that flooded our homes. Right. And now this. It just, I mean, zoning laws are supposed to protect us and they're supposed to represent the people, not just a small group of people. And I and if I hear one more time from somebody on the select board or other people that, well, you're not going to be around forever. The future is the young people and they want small, they want condos. That's a real slap in the face for those of us who paid all those huge taxes, especially village. We paid town and village taxes for years. And okay. it just... Well, I, I, don't, I'm, I apologize if you did hear that. I don't think you heard from me or any other member of the select board. But, uh... Nevertheless, we, we apologize. Uh, to answer your question, my understanding that, uh, for the reason for uh, designating your area of South Main as a, a mixed-use area, from my reading of, of the explanation from the uh, Planning Commission, is that it, it's the gateway to uh, the village center, uh, and that they consider that a little bit different than, say, Randall Street uh, or uh, around the area around the school. Oh, it used to be R2, Roger. And R2 meant we could do single, two, you know, maximum two units mm -hmm. or a single family home. We well, were the gateway then. Yeah. No, I, and Kathy, I appreciate your uh, persistence in coming to these meetings. Uh, we're here to hear, to hear what you have to say. Uh, next. Yeah, Teresa. Good evening, everybody. Uh, first, thank you for serving on the select board. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know it takes a lot of time and energy. Teresa Wood, by the way. Teresa Wood, sorry, um, Perry Hill in Waterbury. So the reason I'm here is for the same reason that other people um, have just spoken, and um, uh, my specific residence isn't impacted, but I've been contacted by several people um, whose residences are impacted, and 
um, I'll be honest, um, they didn't feel like they were being heard. Um, and somehow they thought, you know, maybe me speaking on their behalf might also help them um, to be heard. And um, I, you know, I know that you have, um, you know, you're open to listening to people. And I just, I feel like I need to say how important this is to people and um, that I understand the desire, uh, you know, because we've been looking at this at the state level as well, to increase density in our downtowns. I think there's more than one way to do that. And um, I think that we want to have families and a mixture of older people and younger people and uh, families in our downtown. And um, I'm not sure this is the best way to go about it, frankly. Um, even though those areas are um, designed as mixed use, um, they're also residential neighborhoods. You know, when I look down on North Main Street, I grew up on North Main Street. Um, you know, there, yes, there are businesses there, but there are, you know, several houses in a row in, in those areas on both sides of the street and the same thing on South Main Street and around the park. I mean, it's, I think we need to recognize that they are residential areas um, and they're neighborhoods, just like Randall Street's a neighborhood or Ellenwood Avenue is a neighborhood. And um, people who lived in their homes for 30, 40 years, more than that for some of these people, and now are being told that they, they can't do with them what they intended to do with them, um, whether it's you know building, or dividing their lot, whether it's taking something that was a two-family and turning it into a single family. Um, I, just, I just think it's the wrong move, uh, even though I understand what you're trying to do. And um, I think there are other ways to do that. And, um, you know, we, we did, um, I, I don't know what the governor's going to do with it, but <laughs> the Act 250 law that we just passed would uh, enable people not to need certain permits to build mixed use in, the, in, the, in our village centers. Uh, and um, that's a big deal for, like, developing the, you know, former, um, well, I guess it still is part of the state office complex. I don't know if, if any purchases happened, but at the end of Randall Street, Park Row. <laughs> Feel free to inquire on our behalf. <laughs> okay. Well, if you need me to, I will. Um, so um, I just urge you to really think about this and maybe send the Planning Commission back to the drawing board a little bit on this one. I, I think that there are different ways to do this, and um, I, I really think it's, it's not the right way to go. Um, uh, at this point in time for um, lots of different reasons. So I, I hope that you reconsider um, the recommendation that's being put forth and um, really listen to the folks. And as I said, I'm here representing several folks who contacted me um, and I appreciate you listening. Thank you. Thank you <coughs> Anyone else? Yeah, yes. I was going to stay quiet there, but Teresa enticed me to kind of jump on the wagon that she just got off of. <clears throat> I was speaking to a woman today about affordability, housing issues, cost of living, property taxes. <clears throat> Myself, and that's basically what I can speak to because I know what my life is going through. I'm facing a $5,000 increase in property taxes this year, just here in Vermont. The frustration level in me is building to the point where it's hard for me to hold my tongue because I've worked my whole life, career, working career as an adult, trying to secure a place for myself and my family. Long hours, just endless days. And now to be threatened with possibly having to sell or lose my property as a tax sale, because that's ultimately what it boils down to when you get pushed to the point where you have only those two choices. <clears throat> It almost, and this woman said it very well, 
it almost tears part of your soul away. Because you've worked so hard for so many years, and now it seems like you've lost control or, 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 or things are out of control, no matter you've done what you've done to try to stick with it, you know? And by issues beyond my means, <clears throat> everybody's at risk at this point, I think. A lot of people are at risk. There's some people, like I said before, there's some people that live here that have enough deep pockets that there's nothing you can do to, to you know, force them out of their homes. But for a lot of these people in this room, I think we're all vulnerable. We've all been put in that position now where in one form or another, part of our souls being taken away from us to accommodate another issue that a lot of us feel like maybe we're not 100% responsible for. It's, it's leaders in other places that have made decisions that are, for whatever reason, <coughs> creating this problem we're dealing with now. And it's not gonna get any better in the near future. The way, from the information that I'm seeing, uh, it's not going to get any easier. So I just want to let you know that it's more than just the money part. It's what people are feeling inside and how it's impacting them. I think that's why you're seeing a lot of the frustration you're seeing. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Diane? Diane Bilodeau. Um I think I said pretty much everything I wanted to say last meeting, but this weekend I watched a video um, featuring Keziah Haviland of Yestermoral and concerning development in the Mad River Valley. And one of the points she made, which stuck with me, is that every community is different and it's very important to take into account traditional settlement patterns when developing new bylaws to promote additional housing in an established community. My question is, is it not possible to blend single-family housing alongside multi-family housing? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I've forgotten this both times I spoke. I accept I got 37 signatures on that petition I gave you. Yeah. What I forgot to tell you is four of the places where I went were single family homes that were being used by Airbnb that were owned by people out of the town and out of the state. Mm -hmm. And it seems odd to me that we can let people who don't even contribute to the community other than through taxes from out of state are keeping their single family homes because people want a vacation and they have bigger than a two place, right. but yet we can't. So maybe one of the ways you can control having more housing in the village is um, to, you know, maybe people who are investing in Airbnbs from out of state shouldn't be allowed to do that. I mean, I know my son has an Airbnb and he couldn't afford his house if he didn't. It's a one bedroom one and they live in the other side because taxes are so high and the mortgage is so high, I get that. Yeah. But, you know, there's, there's actually investment companies that are buying up all these houses and turning them into like, if you've ever been to Florida, they have what they call the um, reunion estates and they rent huge houses with pools and everything for people's vacations and that's what's going on here. That's where some of the houses, the Robbins' house, there's one on the end of, two on the end of Bachelor Street. Um, there's the Robinson South, there's another one on South Main. It's, so if it's a bigger problem than people who own their houses all their time that want to keep them a one bedroom, I mean a single family home or be able to change it to it. And I just think you should need to take that, that's a bigger problem. I mean, I know a guy from Essex who at one time bought 10 houses in Waterbury before the prices went up and they're all Airbnbs. I think Kane wants to respond to uh, I just want to <coughs> just, I guess, uh, to be clear, you are suggesting that we regulate short-term rentals? I, I, I don't, I'm, I have I'm mixed feelings about it because I, I see where, I see where people who live in this town, 
who are Vermont taxpayers, it's not their second home, use the Airbnb as a way of being able to afford their high mortgage rates and their taxes. It's the people that are coming here from out of state, and it's their second home, and they, you know, they can afford adding 50000 more onto the asking price of something to get it. And I, I just haven't heard anybody discuss that, even in all the zoning meetings I've been to. I've never heard anybody discuss the impact on outsiders coming here and purchasing houses for the sole purpose of making them Airbnbs. I don't see a short-term rental by somebody who owns a house in Waterbury any different than what I did when I first got married and we created a little apartment so we could pay our taxes. They're living in this community. I have a big problem with people coming here and doing it like they would buy a, you know, four condos on the ocean to run all that. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's just different. And I, and I understand that people just, that's why they're so excited about their registry, because they don't know what your motive is. You know, is your motive to kind of put a stop to that? You know? Also, the other thing, we bought a condo in South Carolina, you know, because we go down there six months. And they, the time we bought it, our taxes on that condo were on the purchase price. In Vermont, you have people coming here from out of state, but paying a million dollars for a house, and on the tax roll it might be 350000 and they're paying taxes on 350000 until there's a new appraisal, which I brought up at town meeting. And that's an issue for taxes. You know, there's a lot of holes in people coming here that aren't paying their fair share. And it feels like the people who are contributing in taxes and committees, I've been on a lot of them. And my, like I said, my husband has been on a lot of them. He was a trustee back in the day when there were villages. He helped bring Ben and Jerry's here. We are doing our part, but we feel like we're being shoved out of our homes so that other people can you know, use it as a business. And I feel like making it a whatever mixed use, that's kind of what you're doing. You're forcing people to make our neighborhood a business. Other comments? Hmm? Oh yeah, Dave. Hello, um, I just had a question on the single family dwelling <clears throat> as a DRB member. If somebody buys a duplex in town and they choose not to rent out one side of it, you can't force people to rent a duplex, right? And they cut a hole in the wall. Now they have a single family home. I mean, enforcement issues, this open, and from my side looking, the, and this, this is going to be a mess because you can't force people to rent out units. So, just wondering if you've taken that in consideration. Mm. Other comments? Uh, anyone from the Planning Commission care to address any of the things? Thank you for the, uh, the written response that we received. Ooh. See my audience. Um, I, I do appreciate you taking the time to uh, address uh, the concerns and uh, stating why the, uh, the regulations came out the way they did. Um, but I didn't know. I had a number of comments uh, again today, pretty much mirroring what, what was addressed uh, on uh, May 6th. Uh, and I don't know if you had any further anything further to add on that. Do you have the uh, recommendations? Yeah. I, I think those we tried to address the comments that were provided last time to expedite that process. I don't know if you want to read them into the record or something. Would that be? I don't have it in front of me. Yeah. Well, it'll be in the record by virtue of being an attachment. I think just to inform our conversation, if the planning commission is willing to read it, it would be for discussion. Okay. And, uh, I did hear Sorry, I said just to inform the conversation. I know our next agenda item is select board conversation and just recognizing that we haven't shared this publicly. If a planning commission member would be willing to read through these bullets, just so we all have that information, I think that would be useful. 
Um, I have it here. I mean, I'll do it, but I want to acknowledge that. This is our planning commission memo. And so I have to read it. Okay. 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 This is the memorandum that we sent to the select board um, based on comments that we heard at the first hearing, the first select board hearing, um, trying to provide a relatively concise summary. So the overarching goals guiding development of the UDBP1, so Unified Development Bylaws, Phase 1. Primary goal of the Phase 1 bylaws is to maintain and increase the number of units along Main Street and downtown and mixed use zoning districts to create a dense, walkable community center. A select board objective cited in purpose, overarching goals, and specific objectives for the draft UDB P1 bylaws dated June 2019 is to encourage more residential units in the downtown zoning district, so downtown and mixed use being included in those. Increasing density in growth areas is prioritized in the town plan, along with smart growth principles. Main Street area, Route 100, is the main thoroughfare through town which hosts our commercial and highest density uses. Mixed uses on Main Street adjacent zoning district found by the railroad tracks to the north, so geographically. The most efficient way to use space in our water and sewer served areas is to have higher density residential and commercial uses. This infrastructure is very expensive to expand. Uh, multifamily is a more expedient way to accomplish this versus single family dwellings. Um, responses to the public comment at public hearings and open houses. So we've had three hearings and two open houses. The select board has had one hearing prior to this. Um, so dozens attended our two open houses and three public hearings who attended to advocate for higher density in the downtown and mixed use. Any current single family dwelling in the downtown or mixed use can continue in perpetuity. But I want to read that again. Any current single family dwelling in the downtown and mixed use can continue in perpetuity. Any owner of a single-family dwelling may sell it without DRB review. The design overlay district, or DROD, was intentionally expanded to allow for additional comment from abutters during DRB design review, including with respect to setbacks. Mixed use has side and rear setbacks. Higher, higher residential densities are also encouraged in the neighborhood zone. So I think in this case, this is me adding on, the neighborhood zones are adjacent to many of these mixed use in downtown areas. And I think it's important to keep that in mind when looking at the overall usage in this village core area. Um, therefore, due to the goals and objectives above, including increasing housing density and resource material available to the Planning Commission, the conversion of multi-use structures to single family dwellings in the downtown and mixed use is prohibited. In conclusion, the PC is attempting to achieve the goals and objectives of our town plan, select board, and the vast majority of the comments received through the UDB P1 process. Who's got me? I went, I went to just about every meeting that they had, and I did not hear a lot of people saying that they wanted to make single family uh, duplexes had the same duplexes. I did not hear that. I think it's a leap to say, yes, they want more housing, and then to say they want to take a homeowner's rights away to do what they want with their home. I, to me, that's a leap. Mm -hmm. And I certainly hear, in the last meeting I went to, most of the people have been saying they want to be able to do what they want with their house. And I don't buy the fact that the railroad separates us because nowhere, I heard a lot of people talk about why us in the flood zone. You don't even mention that here. Why don't you increase the density on Union Street? Why don't you increase the density on Winooski Street? We did. On, we did. We did. We did. We did. Uh, yes, you did, but you didn't take away their right to turn a duplex into a single family home. Why? That, you, nobody answered that yet. It doesn't have anything to do with us being the gateway or anything else. It's just, why? If you're going to do it to us, you have to do it to everybody or no one. I, I don't, I don't understand. So I, uh, I will say one. Yeah, Billy. Really so the principles that we've been applying are consistent with trying to maintain the town with a certain amount of density that would taper down, and then leave the rural areas rural. So we had our rural landscape, we had our scenic views, we have the outside. But the idea is to bring housing in. We needed to do infill. So the idea is, is the highest area with the most density they want starts in the downtown. 
The next section along Main Street, mostly Main Street, is the mixed use. It tapers down. That's the concept. Then we go into the neighborhood zones. That's exactly, so these are smart growth principles. The idea is build up where you already have infrastructure. Build up where you already have capacity for traffic. The entire village has that. It's not just you, it's not just finished. Well, it's tapered down. So well, that's really going to be tapering down. And we know, we heard from the DRB, don't put too much um, density on Union Street because the road didn't have the capacity. So we thought about this, and I will say to other people, this was not just sort of, you know, we clicked our fingers and did this. We met like five times on this. We talked a lot about this, looking for alternatives, hearing the arguments. Kathy, you presented. We have thought long and hard, so, and looking for compromises. And unfortunately, there's no easy fix. If you allow single family development, you can have a trailer on a lot that's 4,000 square feet. So ban what, that what, instead. What do we do? Why would we want that as a town when we're trying to use our downtown resources and infrastructure to bring people in so people can afford to live here? Talk about being blows of your soul. How are people going to afford to live here if we don't get more housing? You want to put it up in the woods? You want to put it up on the Worcester? Where are the families going to live? Are you just... This, I'll just say one more thing. I'm going to shut up because this shouldn't be. Yeah. I'm just saying it's a public hearing, so feel free to All I'm saying is us. we are allowing multifamily housing. So the point is the reason why we have reduced the setbacks, the reason why we've increased the heights, is hopefully people are going to build larger, larger units to have multifamily housing, to have and meet the demands. If we have larger families, they can move in, but you can do that at multiple levels. The whole point is more housing. So uh, yeah, the only more. thing I want to add to what Billy is saying is, it, it, Mark is asking, it's important to, I think it's important. I mean, I don't have a dog in a fight in here. So I just, I look at it as what we heard, and we had uh, those uh, public outreach meetings, which, you know, mm -hmm. we weren't, they weren't run like a public hearing. I went to them. Okay. <laughs> and, um, but what I wanted to say was, what we tried, the compromise, if you will, is anybody with single family housing now can keep it. It doesn't, we're not taking it away. I get that, that, but you are saying, Kathy, can I just? Yeah, okay, sorry. You need to let her speak. Yeah. Um, to us, that was like the riding characteristic that we could keep anyone that has single family. We're, the concept is we're not promoting more single family. So anybody that has it, absolutely, we don't want to take those rights away. And if you want to make it multifamily, that'd be great. But we're trying not to take the multifamily or the multi-unit dwellings and losing housing. That's really the only thing we, uh, we were trying to do. And I'm glad that you did that. But on the other side is that, of it is that if you want to make a single family home out of a duplex you own for your family to live in, you, we aren't allowed to do that. And the other thing that you neglected to say is you had, they had a high street in the mixed juice and you took it out because a lot of the neighborhood came and asked you to take it out. Am I right? Why did why you get taken out? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that we need to be addressing. Okay, well, yes. my, uh, yeah. High Street was originally in the mixed use. And then, am I right? Yep. And the neighbors came and, right? You're supposed to talk to them. The neighbors yeah. came, yeah. gave them the same spiel we're giving, yeah. and they're no longer in mixed use. Right, they did make a number of changes. Uh, they took, they took uh, input, as we're taking input now. Well, I just, uh, what so. makes... High Street's input more important than North Main, no. South Main, and the others. I just don't get it. Uh, okay. <laughs> Can I be done? I'm, I'm happy to answer this question. Okay. Dana. Dana Allen, Planning Commission. Um, we did talk a lot about that. We did receive a lot of comment about High Street, about Union Street, about Stowe Street, a lot of the streets. We also went back and we started looking at these zoning districts. We started looking at where they actually occurred. We started looking at the, the spatial patterns that we saw there, right? The tradition, the character. And what we saw along High Street was very different from what we see along Main Street. Very different. I think a drive through there quickly shows that. And so we deliberated quite a bit about this. And we actually did change that zoning district boundary. And I think that's something to keep globally in mind as we discuss this, is that I've heard a lot in these comments about why are we splitting up 
rules and regulations by area. Why are we telling people in a certain area what they can and cannot do? And fundamentally, that is what zoning is. It is telling owners what they can and cannot do in certain areas. It applies across the board. If we didn't have zoning, we don't have guardrails. And so we're putting up guardrails. I'm sure that at times people will bump against those. I understand that. I bump against those guardrails where I live. I don't love it, but I accept it because I live in this community and I know that it has to be regulated to some degree so that we all have a common level of backstop, if you will. So I think when thinking about this, it's very easy to say we should apply the same rules across the board to all of these zones or all of these districts. And that is antithetical to what zoning is. So sorry, that was a long way of saying we looked at the patterns we saw there, we looked at the uses, we considered it deeply, and we did make a change based in part on comments received as well as patterns observed. Uh, Mary, you had your hand up. Okay. Thank you, Kathy, for, I really did not want my resignation from the Planning Commission to be the public discussion, so, and I'm doing this reluctantly. I worked for 12 years with zoning, with smart growth, with recommendations, with municipal plans, with all of, trying to meet all of the needs that um, zoning can do, that town plan can do, that, you know, select board policy decisions can do. And it is true that creating density in the downtown area, what used to be the village primarily, was a major goal. But the most consistent input that I heard attending all of those informational sessions, attending all of the public hearings, except for the last few planning commission meetings, the deliberations. Nowhere did anyone ask us to remove the ability for single family dwellings. And the most consistent opposition was to, from downtown, People who live in the downtown, people who live in the proposed mixed use said, why are you doing this? So nobody's disputing that we need more housing. Nobody's disputing all of the changes that are um, proposed to create more density in this part of town. What I and others are opposed to is not allowing one type of housing when we need every type of housing wherever we can put it. That's just, I want to make that clear. Any other comments? Here. I was just asking, is there anyone online who yeah, has a comment? I don't see any hands up. Uh, I don't see anyone <coughs> wanting to speak. Yes. Diane. I just have sure. one other comment that I wanted sure. to share. Where I live, I have eight units on one side. There are six units, kitty corner to me across the street. There are another six or eight units on the Zachary building. Over on this side, there are multiple uh, units as well, mm -hmm. housing. So that's pretty dense where I am right now. There's a lot of families, or couples rather, because there aren't very many kids. Uh -huh. they're, they're couples, most of them, that are living there, and dogs. <laughs> Everybody has a dog. So I think, I think North Main Street's doing pretty well with multiple housing already. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, Cheryl, Laura, <laughs> online. Um, thank you. Uh, this is Cheryl Laura. I live in Waterbury. Um, I know you all have an email from me. Um, and my really big concern, along with all the rest that was talking about, is the height of the buildings that they're going to allow um, in certain parts of the village. Um, and I'm specific about the village because we're not a city. Um, and I think 60 feet is going to really um, cause harm to what people come to this town to see. Um, so I just want that on the minutes that um, that is one of my big concerns. I think that's too high. And I think that should be uh, looked at 
scrutinize um, really well and um, lower that down a lot. But thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, you did, uh, thank you, uh, send us uh, some feedback uh, between the meetings. I think you're recommending uh, a limit of 40 feet. Is that correct? Uh, yes. I know in some other areas they have the 48 feet. Thing. I just, you know, I, I actually went around town and counted stories, right? And I counted stories in other towns and, uh, you know, 40 feet seems to be what most people are building at, maybe 48, but again, I'm not an engineer, uh, but 60 is quite extreme um, as far as I can tell other communities. Okay. Uh, 60 feet is what our fire department allows, right? Because that's how high our ladder goes. Uh, yeah. 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 Roger. Yeah. I, didn't, I just think it should be pointed out that it's 60 feet now. We didn't raise it. Yeah, yeah, we didn't change The adopted anything. interim bylaws since 2021 have been 60 feet. Yeah. So, I, I, you know, the concern of massive upbuilding in the last three, four years hasn't been seen. Good point. Yes, and, and I agree, but we've not been building to 60 feet. And those are interim. These are going to be something that impacts the future immensely um so while i agree maybe they they've already been there but i'm not sure why those were there and nobody could explain that to me okay uh tom just a note from conversations i've had with different developers over the past year um what they have generally said to me is um once you are above four stories there's a whole different set of rules related to fire suppression and it's a whole different and higher set of costs. So in essence, what they've said is, no one builds five-story buildings. You, you stop at four, or you do 10, in short. Um, general rule of thumb that a number of developers have said um, So, you know, I think perhaps the, the natural limit is really lower than, lower than 60 because of that. At least the way the economics are today and the rules are today. Okay, good to know. Yes, Teresa. Um, the first thing I want to say is I really appreciate the Planning Commission members being here and um, explaining the rationale um, and the background. I think that's important, and so I just want to say thank you for doing that. Um, the, the thing that concerns me a little bit, though, is I sit here and I think about us um, really promoting even more um, multi-unit housing is I start to think about these neighborhoods in Burlington that are essentially 100% multi-unit housing. And um, it's not a pretty picture, to be honest with you. Uh, and I, I think, you know, maybe, I don't know if there's ways to incentivize people as opposed to, you know, people feel penalized. I, I'm understanding that. If there's ways maybe to incentivize people who want to do, you know, multi-unit, mm -hmm. as, as opposed to sort of prohibiting people from doing you know, single family units. It, it feels like we would want a, a good mixture of that. And, um, you know, if you, I just was thinking about what Diane said and thinking about all the apartments um, around you. And I think about down on South Main Street, you know, with the influx of new building down there and all of the apartments down there. And um, I think we're fastly losing um, in our downtown single family housing. and. Uh, I'm not sure we have a good mix. You know, I think it's all about having a good mix, not only about density. So I just would, you know, hope people consider that as well. I have a question about enforcement. Yeah. Because when we, when we had our zoning issue and we tried to get it enforced, we were told the town has no budget for it. So we fronted that $100,000 thing on our own, okay? Mm -hmm. And I know when I went to town meeting this year, you added $10,000 into your enforcement budget. So if I choose to turn my, if this, bat, this passes, and I choose to make my duplex back into a single family home for my son, what's going to happen to me? And still get charged $6,000 by um, natural resources for something I had to pay $100,000 to remedy. Uh -huh. So, and I didn't know I could sue the town, or I would have because of that. 
but I will next time. <laughs> um, so I just want to know, who, how are you going to enforce it? Can I make a hole and say, okay, somebody's going to enter from the back door and they can use my kitchen and bathroom and just give them one room and call it a, that I've well, made it? According a, to Dave, uh, apparently. Well, I think you're going to see a lot of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so who's going to enforce it? Who's yeah. going to do it? I, I can answer that. I also wanted to respond to Mr. Rogers, who asked essentially the same question. Mm -hmm. um, the reality is we're, we're beefing up. We intend to really focus on zoning enforcement. We're getting there. We've got a staff person. We're headed in the right direction. Zoning enforcement, in reality, step one is simply enforcing your own permit approvals. Um, permit gets approved. Someone does the job. You go and you check the site where the setbacks follow, all those things. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, it generally boils down to community complaints. Mm -hmm. You know, I doubt we're going to have the time or resources to suddenly start going through our list of permits issued over the last decade and say, well, let's, let's check every one. You know, so the reality is if someone has a multifamily and they decide to cut a wall internally and rent it as a single family, we'll likely never know. That's, that's the reality to enforcement. Um, so that's... Just a factual, honest statement, I, I, and, I, and I think that's not about Waterbury, but I think any town, if right. you do something inside the building, it's awfully hard for zoning officers to know, to see, to see. so unless someone complained, yep, yeah, you're right, Dave, I think we wouldn't know. Mm -hmm. Next, you up in uh, reappraisal, though, Tom? Uh, well, not, not every home is entered during the reappraisal. Right. And generally, the ones that we, I mean, the only ones we enter were, were allowed in. So, quite unlikely. All right. Thank you. Um, just noting the time, um, you know, we have had uh, several different hearings on these uh, bylaws, proposed bylaws, uh, and uh, I appreciate again all the time that uh, the general public has put in and coming to these meetings, voicing your concerns, uh, and uh, you know, getting feedback. I also appreciate the work that the Planning Commission has, has put in, not only coming to these hearings, but uh, coming every Monday night for the past year, or maybe two years, uh, to, to get these uh, regulations in place. Uh, so it is a tremendous amount of work, uh, and it's obviously there. Uh, some compromises that uh, you've had to already reach, uh, and uh, so I think uh, we're also going to have some discussion up here. Do I have a motion to close the uh, open hearing on bylaws? So I can, uh, if you want, it, you can have it. I make a motion to uh, close the public hearing. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. We have now closed the public hearing on the bylaws and we will move to deliberations uh, on the uh, proposed bylaws, or what are currently in force right now, actually. Do I have a motion? Raise your hand up. Yeah. You do. I can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I make a motion that we should amend the zoning bylaws in the mixed use district to allow uh, where houses were previously multifamily housing, if the current owner wants to convert it back to single family housing. Especially, let me, let me leave it at that and I'll do it in discussion. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Do we have a second? Do we have another motion? How's that? I mean, this is going to be a mini bot, uh, monologue from Alyssa, so apologies to everyone. Um, if you didn't know, I was hired in Waterbury in 2017 to be the economic development director. I was 22. I just graduated from UVM. I did not grow up in Waterbury. My parents are fortunate to own the one home I grew up in, um, which is not in Vermont. And 
Um, I didn't know anything about anything, so the first thing I did was go to way too many planning commission hearings because I figured at least it was tangible and I could read bylaws and perhaps think about how to participate in them. Um, I think the first thing I just want to remind everyone is everyone's in this room because they care about Waterbury. I want to thank the planning commission for being here. Um, Again, I started attending the meetings about this rewrite, about those 2019 goals and objectives in 2019. I think we spent, we spent like four meetings when Calabo, Bellabo was chair on the ordering of the appendix of the, like, what was going to be in the discussion. And um, it's just been a really long process to try and move this forward. And it's a lot of folks really trying their best. And I really want to acknowledge the current planning commission and the time they put in, former planning commission members, the time they put in, it's just been a huge group. And also acknowledge they're a volunteer board. We don't even have a stipend policy. They're receiving zero dollars. You all know from town meeting, we receive about 1,200 a year. I spent six hours on the phone between yesterday and today on the zoning bylaw. So I think just to acknowledge, we are all trying to do our best to create a policy that works for Waterbury. And I think everyone has good intentions, and it's about figuring out how we can get this right. I will also say one of the first stories I heard was around the flood regulations. I moved to Waterbury after those were adopted in 2016. And one of the things that was really hard is that the Planning Commission worked for years and solicited input from as many folks as they could. And then they went to the select board, and the select board adopted something different than what the Planning Commission recommended. And the Planning Commission didn't feel great about that. So I just want to acknowledge, I'm not even giving a statement of where I stand on this yet, but what we as a select board are trying to weigh is respecting the work of our volunteer community members. You all elect us. We serve on the select board. We appoint folks who are willing to volunteer to take on this work of doing their best to use resources from our paid planning staff from best practices from the state to come up with a proposal for us as the select board to hear and move forward. So I'm going to let some other folks speak first, but I just want to acknowledge that's where we're coming from. The world isn't fair. Folks are coming from really different perspectives. And I will say, I started working here in 20, 2017. I moved here in 2018. I live in multi-unit housing. If that didn't exist, I would not live in Waterbury. I worked here for three years. As soon as I stopped being paid by the town, I applied to be on the planning commission. I served as chair for a year. I'm now entering my third year on the select board. So I don't think what type of housing you live in dictates your ability to contribute to the community. I don't think that any of our intention is to be creating neighborhoods that don't all contribute positively to Waterbury. We want all of the neighborhoods to contribute positive to Waterbury. And what we're here to do tonight is to figure out the best set of policies and procedures to do that. And that's what our discussion is going to be about. We're going to try and move forward. This is not all set in stone. Part of the reason we're working so hard on moving this forward tonight is because we do have hodgepodge regulations from when we had a village and when we had a town. And part of what took seven years to dissect was like three different things named village mixed commercial residential. And so we're here tonight with an incredible product, thanks to what the Planning Commission has worked on moving forward. And we as a board are going to try to figure out the best way to honor the work the Planning Commission has put into this and also make sure that we're serving our community as well. the DRB and all of the uh, town uh, commissions. But we've, I've heard in these select board meetings and public hearings loud and clear that people want some choices. And I think that's really important. It's, I, don't, I live in a single family house in, 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 in the center. I've been involved in, in affordable housing for over 30 years professionally as a program director at USDA Rural Development. So I understand affordable housing. But I don't understand where folks are being going to be denied, such as Kathy Grace, if she wants to convert a house back, who, which probably was a single family house at one point in time, to back to a single family house to account for a family member. I don't think this is going to create a whole bunch of Single family housing development, I think it's really smart that we have 
mixed development. I think it's very important in community. It creates walkable, you know, livable communities, which I think is what Waterbury is all about. But I don't think it's easy to tell people who have property to say, you can't do this any, any, any longer because, because you've converted this property to a, a multifamily house that you can't convert it back to a single family property for fam family needs or, or other. You know, and, and especially ones that were previously single family homes. That's all I have to say. Thank you. I'm happy to jump in. Um, being <laughs> new to the select board, uh, this has by far been the most contentious issue that I've seen by a long shot. And this one has kept me on the phone for the past several days, just like it has Alyssa. And we've been working tirelessly to figure out this is a really, really hard decision for all of us on this board, I would imagine. Um, looking at these bylaws, there's a lot that I love about these bylaws. Hearing public comment about this gives me pause. And I want there to be a way where everyone can come out on top on this. And it, the more I think about it, the harder that, that becomes. I recognize the idea that not only the planning commission, but the town is, is looking to increase density in the downtown district. Um, and this is, is um, you know, a way forward for, to that goal. Um, that's very important. Um, and I recognize, you know, how the necessity of that. I also struggle with um, how else do I put it, but controlling what people can and can't do with property they own. That doesn't sit well with me. And I'm trying to come to a, a place where I can get over that struggle that I'm having um, with property owners, again, with property that they own, to say you can, can't do this. But I also recognize the goals of, of not only the planning commission, but of this town. And um, again, not putting a motion forward at this moment, um, but I, I, I want to publicly acknowledge like, that this has been hard for all of us. And I, I hear the emotions in the room, and the emotions are within us, too. Um, so thank you again for your public comments um, on all this. And it's, it's shaped at least my thinking on this topic. Um, just uh, and, uh, towards uh, full disclosure, uh, Kathy mentioned that uh, one of the members of the select board uh, converted uh, his or her house uh, from a duplex back into a single-family house. And that happens to be me. Um, I uh, bought the house as a, a duplex, which was not easy to do because uh, the, in the real estate market, they uh, don't consider the value of a, a duplex. It's considered a commercial property, and I had to show, I had to demonstrate how it was going to cash flow. Uh, and I was going to be living in half of it, so that was not particularly easy, and uh, it wasn't easy to get a uh, mortgage that way. Um, but we made it work. Um, and uh, then after about eight years, uh, we had a couple of kids, continued renting half of it, and then uh, when the kids were about I don't know, eight years old or thereabouts, uh, we took over the whole place. Um, actually, density stayed the same because we had two kids. We, we made two additional residents. And uh, <laughs> those residents also like, went to school, played sports, did a lot of good stuff for the community. Uh, hopefully, we'll continue to. Um, but I guess from my perspective, that does, that, that does address our, our need for density, our, our need for mixed use. Uh, we want kids in our neighborhoods. Um, and I tend to agree that we don't want all just like separate little units with, uh, you know, um, no, no big families around. Uh, I think that families is, is part of the vitality of uh, the, the town and what we're looking for in this area of, uh, of Waterbury as well as uh, back to Easy Center. 
So, uh, and I, uh, again, a lot of people have said how much we appreciate uh, what the, uh, the Planning Commission has done, and I certainly uh, back that up. I think there's a tremendous amount of great things here, getting uh, pathways for ADUs, uh, clarifying a bunch of issues that were not well clarified before. Wonderful work. I'm going to be looking for maybe just one small change in what we've got right now, uh, and I'd be willing to move forward. Roger, what does that change? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll be the one to ask the question. I'm not afraid. Um, it has to do with that. Uh, not uh, putting restrictions on uh, single family housing. I don't. I don't think it's going to make that much difference, and I think that's clearly a sticking point for a lot of people in this audience. I think we're going to get what we want, even if we allow that to go through. So, so Roger, you, you, you're, just so I understand, you want to create a zoning rule that's dependent upon the current ownership of the house. So if you currently own it, five years from now, you want to convert it back to single family, you can do that? Is that what you're uh, asking? Specifically, I would uh, make uh, single family uh, occupancy a conditional use. In the mixed use district or all mm -hmm. districts? So that means you have to go through, explain what that means, Ryan. We have to go through DRB? Um, you would have to go through DRB, but it's a, an approved conditional use, right? Is that an easy thing for the DRB to do? I mean, I've never. <coughs> yes. <laughs> if, it, if, if it's a conditional use, yes. the DRB probably wouldn't have a problem. If it meets all the other criteria they look at, you know, being a former DRB member. So Roger, is it okay to ask a question? Um, that's a good question. Yes, I need to. Uh, I need someone to make a motion. I'll make a motion to for conditional use of single family homes. What's that? In the mixed use. In the mixed use. Mixed use. I second that motion. Okay. Um, any discussion? I will give a speech now. Um, I am a single person who lives in an apartment who doesn't plan to breed to fix our density problem. Um, but I've worked. <laughs> but, uh, but I work in this town, and more than likely. More, more than likely, most of the people that you run into who work in the shops and in the restaurants that you frequent also rent in this town. And we are quickly running out of options. And that means that our restaurants and our bars and our shops have to pull labor in from elsewhere. And that takes the money that you are spending at those shops and it's sending it to Burlington and it's sending it to Essex, and it's sending it to wherever we can find labor. It's not keeping it here. And one of the big parts of why keeping, keeping with the Planning Commission's plan is to allow for people who work here to live here, to continue participating in our local economy. Because if we can't do that, we don't have a local economy. We have restaurants and bars that give away, like, you know, pay their employees, and their employees have to pay rent elsewhere, and they have to spend their money elsewhere at other grocery stores. It doesn't, it doesn't cultivate our economy here. And as, as we keep losing workforce, the problem will only get worse. That's my speech. I'll just note that uh, of those two uh, beings that we produced. Both worked in the restaurant industry in this town. Uh, one is a uh, ceramic uh, hydrology uh, engineer, uh, aka dishwasher. Uh, <laughs> and the other is a server over at Pocake. Oh <laughs> Just as a comment to what King has said, although I agree with him, 
workforce housing is really important. But also, a lot of our employers have not invested in workforce housing. Yes. They, they you know, it's the old, old fashioned where in Vermont you had a town, you had a mill in town. The town, the, the, the mill built a bunch of row houses for their employees. I'm not going to pick on any business, but we have a number of businesses who probably can develop a small multifamily housing property. And they choose not to. Yes, they, I agree. They, it's just, it, it, it's a problem. Workforce housing is a real issue. I'm not against what Kane says. I think we need to provide, but I don't think forcing people in a whole district to be the, the standard bearers of having to maintain multifamily housing. I think options are an important thing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Anne Imhoff. Uh, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, everybody talks about housing, but I had a housing, but I could not find work in this town. So, you know, it flips. It took me practically 20 years of living here before there was a job that I could fulfill. So it works both ways. I had to, I worked in Burlington, I worked in Montpelier before I ended up working at Coffee Roasters. And now the job I had at Coffee Roasters, I would have had to move, start working in Essex because what Thanks. I was doing here, you know, shut down. So it works both ways. I moved here because I wanted to be in a small New England village. And I'm afraid, yes, we need housing. I don't deny that. But if we change too much, we are going to lose what initially brought people like myself to Vermont. So you've got to be careful about how your wording was proposed. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Anne. Appreciate your comments. Okay, yeah, just, um, we have uh, Kathy. Yeah, I, I should have said this earlier, but like we keep talking about the single family homes that are single family homes, changing them back is gonna make a big difference. But I know I have two young sons, they both bought houses and they were could only put two units in them because that was the rule, one on Union Street. Uh -huh. Jonathan bought his, it was a, already an existing two. There's room for two more, but the zoning didn't allow it then. Now you're gonna change the zoning to allow it, so you're gonna pick up more. The same, the guy, the beautiful, beautiful old um, house next to his, uh, Squire House. Hmm. It's not beautiful anymore. That guy was only, he paid too much for it, and he only, he only was allowed two housing units for it. And he's going to rejoice at this because now we'll be able to put six or seven. Because the kids nowadays didn't, they pay most of, the, most of them now, especially now, more than 3% interest. So they can't keep a single family home, a single family home and pay $8,000 a year in taxes. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you letting us decide what we want to do with our house is going to, it's not an either or. It's not going to prevent more multifamily housing because there are a lot of big houses here where people have been waiting. You know, like I would have made my little yellow house into a three family house back in the day, but we were only allowed to do two. Mm -hmm. So I, I think right. it's not, we can have both. <laughs> Good point. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah, Diane? I'm just looking for clarification. When, when you made your motion, mm -hmm. Would that include a single family home in my backyard for my daughter? That's not built yet? Good question. Uh, That's a good question. So, yeah, this would be a conditional use. Yeah. And it will include making a duplex back into a single if it needs to be? Conditional use. Conditional use. <laughs> okay, uh, we have a motion that's on the table, it's been seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. 
Any opposed? Okay, any opposed? And any abstentions? Mm -hmm. Motion carries. Okay. Um, uh, as I understand it, this is a substantial change in the uh, bylaws. Uh, so, that means that uh, we need to send it back to the Planning Commission. Do I have a motion? I make a motion to send the planning of uh, the zoning bylaws back to the Planning uh, Commission based upon the changes that were made this evening. Go ahead and second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, that carries through. Thank you again. Sorry if uh, we're creating more work for you, but uh, we're just doing our job too. Does this mean you have a hearing again, Roger, when it comes back? Um, Another hearing? This means, um, this means the planning commission. What, what? This one is the planning commission in a regular sure. meeting, not a not a public hearing, a regular meeting. Reviews of the proposed changes, makes some revisions to the documents along the lines of the select board's motions. Um, brings that back to the select board for another public hearing on the new document. Okay. And that would be a public hearing at the select board level. Next meeting. As soon as King comes back, we'll take up the next agenda item, which is the discussion of the bylaw of uh, the rental registry ordinance. This will be the third hearing for adoption. To fill the space, I'll just say these are two of our other agenda mm -hmm. items. Just recognizing bylaws have to do with housing, so do rental registries, and so does the proposal for a housing trust. And just say, like, we have a housing trust. For, as someone said, because I was there presenting, and our goal is to look at this from a lot of angles. So, to be resumed on the bylaws, and also we have these ones, so stick around. <laughs> <laughs> should ask everybody, the select board, did they work in the fair of the day? What's that, Chris? I said I should have asked the select board members if they all wore two pairs of pants before they came in here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> get the butts chewed out of one of them. <laughs> All right, um, we'll now take up uh, the rental registry ordinance. Uh, this is the third hearing for adoption. Um, this, when first presented, had uh, some other uh, elements to it, uh, including a uh, requirement for a, um, what was it, uh, the key? The knock box. Fire department requests. Yeah, the fire department's request for a uh, knock box. Uh, that has been removed. Uh, there was another uh, proposed uh, regulation. I'm spacing on what it was, but it has also It's been a limiting the security deposit. Oh, yes, limiting the security deposit. That has now been removed. So and then the, uh, there was one on the designated responsible person and the response time. Yeah. Right. And that has been removed? Yes. Okay. So now what we have is just a proposed uh, rental registry. Uh, any fees attached to that? There are no fees attached to that. No fees attached to it. And uh, the, but anyone renting uh, any uh, housing in Waterbury, be it short term, medium term, or long term, uh, would be required to register by January 1st. 2025. Correct. Okay. So that's what's before us. And we are now opening up for what could be the final hearings. So just, just to be clear, I now, why don't you step forward and we'll make a statement? I'm ready. I'm sorry? Stay, yeah, come forward. forward. Everybody else got to stand in here. Come on, guys. So my name is Ben Graham. I live in Union Street. All I wanted to say was last meeting I heard, I didn't hear about the fee was waived. What I heard Tom say was we would waive the fee until after you determine the administrative costs, which is set by the state to not exceed the actual administration. Uh, not quite. Um, so fees 
by law should be directly tied to the cost of administration. That's what I said, administrative fees. Yeah. You're, you're not supposed to profit. Okay, so right. Yes. So did you waive the fees, or are you just it, putting it, them off to, to there, determine what the administrative costs are going there, to be? There's no fee in the ordinance. I don't believe there's going to be. Okay, nobody changed the website for the. Uh, no, I don't think I did. Okay. I don't believe. Um, I don't believe there's going to be much in the way of, of, of staff time to, to get this up and running. Okay. That may change in future years. Of course it will. But if, if um, you know, but what would that be? I mean, it's not going to be a hundred grand to, to get a basic registry where essentially the, the intent is to to use some software we're purchasing that's not part of this cost because we're purchasing. Which was already approved for that's other correct. departments. That's correct. So you so should not associate those. those costs with this. That's correct. Okay, okay good. But the point would be people who own property go and go and fill out the form online mm -hmm. and then we work with the data from a staff perspective with this lecture with the housing task force. So so really um, is it the housing task force that asked for this registry? Yes. Is the housing task force appointed by you? Yes. Yes. Okay. Where can I read their stuff? Because I looked for it and I couldn't find it's it. It's on the website under committees. It okay. is on that is yeah. the housing task force. Okay, great. So, so, so I think guess, long story short, um, I don't really see administrative costs aside from a little staff time associated with this registry. And and if in fact there were people who who didn't fill out the registry, that's what the penalty section is for. So that's not an administrative cost, there's a way to recover those costs through penalty. So I, I think the enforcement uh, costs. Correct. Okay. And that's different. So I think in general, um, I don't have a crystal ball, but I, I just don't see a big cost burden with this at all. I really don't see much of any cost burden. Okay. Does anybody really come up with an idea like why we need this? Like why are we here doing this? <clears throat> yes. Yes. Well, what is it? I mean I, I mean I have prepared, you know, itemized questions to all of these you know, what is this called? So, uh, the purpose? Yeah. A lot of reasons. Okay. Um, um, the, the first is um, there's not easily and, and I think really solid data available on short term rentals without creating a registry. So, we don't, we don't really have the data. Have you ever gone on the websites to see what's available? On right, there? but, but it's, not, it's far from perfect. And so, part of the intent is to simply gather data. Um, the number of short-term rentals and the number of long-term rentals we have, and to try to try to watch that data over time and, and see if anything, what can the town do or what should the town do if we think there's, you know, there's some ways that, that you know the market is not responding in, in the way we might hope. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I was talking to I was actually at a conference on Friday, and uh, I was talking to some folks um, in another town. Um, and interestingly enough, what did they learn from their registry? They learned there's an awful lot of accessory dwelling units that are not rented. Why? Because the landlords, um, the landlords think the essentially are, are fearful of the risk of renting to a bad tenant and not recovering, not recovering their investment. That's and a very so, valid fear. And so there's a lot of there's a lot of empty rental units. Right. And so, so from that perspective, they're now saying, well, we have this information. We never anticipated that. Everyone thinks the, the rental market's great. What well, not come up with for a solution for that, like getting those properties they're back? They're still working on that. But, but, but essentially, what, what, I've, what I heard from a number of people at this conference was that um, what we're seeing is, is the rental market becoming, I guess for lack of a better word, a little bit more corporate and a little less mom and pop. And, and that's one trend this one town observed. And I thought that was really insightful. It's because they have a registry. Okay, and so great, I think right, great, that's great. That's insightful information and stuff, but nobody has a solution to that. You well, know, I think in a, before in a, in a you state where the where the government is so uh, pro tenant, I completely understand these people's fears. You yeah. know, I mean, it just last fall, you know, I had to do a repair job on a. On a rental, a long-term rental unit, and I had to replace three window sills and a countertop, and the woman hadn't even paid her second month's rent yet. Yep. And that repair cost more than her security deposit. I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. You know, and, and the landlord was at a loss. She's like, what do I do? This dog chewed up this house in one month, and this woman signed a lease for a year. Like, what do you do? So I understand these fears of not being able to rent these places. I guess, I guess my answer to you is, is 
go back to the to the earlier part of this meeting, the zoning bylaws were worked on for, for eight years. And, and what was what was reached in the end was a 50, I think a 57 page document by the Planning Commission and the Select Board is interested in amending a couple of sentences. It took a long time to get there and, and I guess what I'm suggesting is this is the registry, this is to gather the data. We won't have the data until January of 2025. I think it's gonna take time to do some analysis and, and, and that's gonna change over years the more data we get, but without data. The answer of what can we do? Well, if we do anything, we're, we're shooting in the dark a little bit. So let's at least take an educated position on what we, what we can do. At least that's my perspective. I think, you know, Joe can write. In all honesty and respect, for sure, but your perspective really doesn't hold a lot of weight here. It's these five people that are going to vote on this and everything, you know? And there's some serious biases here, for sure, about, you know, rental in general and everything. And, um, you know, if I just feel like that this is not a path that's going to yield any tangible results, we might get information, but we're not going to get anything that we can, or the board has any power to do anything all over aside from strictly regulating short-term rentals. That's literally the only power that you people are, are going, you people, you five people, that, that's the only power that you're going to get from, from this information. Strictly regulating is, is certainly um, something that the board has legal authority to do. There really hasn't been any conversation about that. Um, I'm actually surprised by that the, statement the, there. The, the, other, the other piece is that now that we are we are approaching the end of phase one of the zoning bylaws, which is really the part of the town that has established development patterns, perhaps having a rental registry and seeing 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 short term rentals and where they're growing and where they are in the rest of Waterbury could inform phase two, which is going to involve other parts of the town. So, and that's not that's a different form of regulation, if you will. But I, but I think I think. In the end, you know, again, I think having good data is going, to, is going to yield some good fruit. What we do with it is a different matter, and can we do anything with that's it? That's my point. Matter? What can you do? There's only one thing that you can do, and that's, you know, this is like, it's, you can't stop second, you know, rich people from buying second homes, you know, which is overwhelmingly one of the causes of, of the lack of housing in this state, you know? You can't, you know, the only thing that you're going to be able to do is restrict people like me you know, recovering from three floods to make a little money off of my house um, and not have a full-time tenant that's going to trash my place. Well, what I will say is, I, I hear you, I'm, I'm not disagreeing. What I will say is, uh, I'm not disagreeing in the sense that these are really difficult problems to solve. But later on our agenda, there is a proposal to create a housing trust. And that involves, or could involve in theory, some investment in housing on the part of the town. And so, I think would already, that investment help cover the losses of landlords from errant tenants? That was actually, or was it the other way around, just trying, like what I heard Mr. Sweeney say in the last meeting, trying to get people the down payment so they could move into places? So, that, yeah, those issues were discussed. And so, yeah, it could. I mean, I think, I think in the end, um, this is the start of that conversation. It's the first time I believe well, it's what I understand, the last hearing on this conversation. I'm yeah. talking about the registry conversation. Yeah. From what I understand, this is the last hearing on this conversation. Um, it's the last hearing if the select board decides to vote on it, and then they can always, of course, amend an ordinance, but um, it's, I, I'm, not the de I'm not the decision maker on whether or not this is brought up. Well, you're the one who wants to talk. <laughs> I'm just trying to answer your questions. I'm okay, okay, right on. Um, does anybody else have anything to say? I got a lot. Okay, yeah, I'm like, I just want to address some of your questions. I know you don't believe in maybe what some of what Tom says, but I think the select board in general, and I'll speak for myself, but I'm, I'm sure I have a lot of backing among other select board members, that this, and this is a concern I know among a lot of landlords, a registry does not restrict a lot of things. It's here as a fact finding. Result in regulation? That's what I'm worried about. It might, but it might not. Yeah, right. You know, you can't, you, you've got to have facts to make determinations. I know a lot of people are concerned about you know, you know, short-term rentals. And you know, that's one of my concerns in, in this town about you know, where they are, especially out-of-state investment. But I don't think any of us would be putting this 
rental re registry, it's basically, we can't do anything unless you have data. You know, if, if you're shooting from the hip, you're not being a responsible, you know, you know, governance. No, I understand that. So, but there are what, other ways to get this data. You know? I, I'm not saying there's not, but the best way is to figure out what you have and figure out what, you know, what your rental makeup is to figure out how to deal with some of the problems. Right, so how many people, now that the fee has been waived, how many people do you think are gonna just throw their applications at your fee, and be, you know, that, you know um, give you the data? So I've been in contact with the uh, Vermont Short-Term Rental Association and talking to other towns, and um, in general, those towns that have registries have had a really good response, and that's because the, the short-term rental organizations are not opposed to registries. They are opposed to regulation, I want yeah. to make that 100% clear. So they tend to, I think they help their members in a big way to make sure they, they fill out the registry, get the information to us. Okay. Ben, so, uh, you asked uh, previously uh, about why, why was this brought to us. We have the chair of the uh, Housing Task Force here, Joe Camerata. Joe, you had I heard what Joe said the last meeting. Is it going to be anything different than that? Or? No, it's going to be exactly the same thing. Okay, great. So we know. I mean, go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, go ahead. I mean, it's, as Tom and Mike pointed out, right, we need to understand the impact that rentals are having on our housing stock, so we know what kind of housing stock to incentivize in the future, whether we incentivize that through zoning or whether we incentivize it through the housing trust. Well, you keep saying incentivize, like what do you mean? Then who owns? Yeah, please. I mean, we heard a lot of discussion this evening, right, about the bylaws and the single family houses, and there was a lot of discussion around short term rentals that were happening here. To me, that's all anecdotal because we don't know for sure how big of an impact that's had. I'm not saying it's anecdotal that the people you pointed out have people are. I'm sure that's the case, mm -hmm. right? But is that two issues or is it about 188 rentals in February? How many of those came from the long term rental housing stock? How much of that is impacting what Kane said earlier? I don't know. And if I don't know, if we can't answer that question, then how can we answer the question around what to do with the housing trust fund? How can we answer the question about what should we be doing from our, our bylaws? And whether you're concerned about regulations, regulations will happen with or without information. But to Mike's point, I'd rather have the information. And if you say there's another way to collect this information, please don't, because we've been trying to get it from You us. simply just go on Airbnb and just do, do your homework. They don't, you know? no. We track it down. They don't give it down to the address level. You know? Do you really need the address level? I mean, it's it's you, you can literally see all of the properties regardless of exactly where they are. You can get the general neighborhood, you know, of their location and stuff, and it will tell you how many people they sleep, how many beds they have, how many parking spaces they have. Okay, this is not a debate. Uh, so uh, let's uh, take. I've seen a number of hands go up. Uh, Kane, you have your hand up. You're next. I was just going to say to to. Ben's, I guess, point right now um, was that you, of course you can go on Verbo and Airbnb and all the rental websites, but those posts come up and go down every day. And to get accurate data, just asking the person who owns the property. Well, I don't understand what you mean, go up and go down. No, no, I'm sorry. But this, this, just, this works with one person's talking. This is not a debate. It's, it's un not a debate. Unfortunately, this is the only time I have to get my questions answered. I'll help you. I'll help you. You just have to play by the rules, so which is I recognize people and they get to speak, and then I recognize another person. That's how it works. Okay, to your point, to your question about going on their websites. So you can post your, your short-term rental or take it down. If I go to, on the website today, I'm not going to be able to see if a post was taken down if someone took their Airbnb off the market for two weeks of a year, right? Or six months of a year. I'm not gonna be able to see that. Yes, you will. It helps by just asking, it's more helpful to us to ask the landowner, right? Because then we get a full picture. How long are they rented for? Is it short term? Is it long term? If it's short term, is it two weeks? Is it six months? Is it nine months? It helps us gather data. and. And helps us paint a full picture of the entire rental situation, whether it's short term or whether it's long term, in the town of Waterbury. Melissa, you had your hand up. No? Yes. Oh, I, it was on the feed point. I just wanted to say we had minutes from 4.15, noting that 
I think it was genuine intent around not charging a fee. I guess I was saying, in the interest of sharing data, we're not trying to make this overly onerous for folks. And just reiterate the fact of, in the three years I've been on the board and in the many years prior, this is a perennial issue that comes up every year. The Planning Commission kindly sat here tonight and had all of the anger and feedback directed at them. And this is one issue where they have asked the select board to take leadership around thinking about short-term rentals and the impact on the community. We further consulted the housing task force to take an even more holistic look at that. We had long-term renters. Um, we had landlords and folks who were long-term renters acknowledging that often there's a very interesting interplay between using short-term rental to subsidize long-term rental. Folks like yourself using short-term rentals to help support their operations. And to be clear, we're not, I don't think, trying to set up to be in a place to do anything about that. Again, the, the alternate is we have every so often a blow up where folks come in and say, I'm worried about the septic from my neighbors who's sleeping 10 people in a house that's not permitted for that next door. And it becomes a situation where we as local municipal officials do have to shrug our shoulders and say, we haven't looked into any way to regulate that, so we're gonna have to defer you to state processes that we know aren't serving your needs. So again, in an effort to look at saying what is actually happening in our community, is there a real community, and is there any sort of policy tool that we might want to use to adjust that? Again, we just had a 45-minute dialogue about how public policy is hard and challenging and targeting is hard and challenging. Other communities across the state are living with right now. There's communities where, again, there's very specific exemptions around folks who live here. There's proposals around subsidizing folks. Again, different things, but again, the intent is true around saying it's information gathering, because if not, we can just, we can continue this. Maybe we will. But I don't see us substantively being in a different area other than just saying, you live next to Stowe, Vermont, you have a short-term rental problem, and you as local officials are just saying, yeah, we know it's a dynamic. Dana, you've had your hand up a long time. Um, Dana Allen. Um, Waterbury resident, also on the Planning Commission. Um, i just like to say, as a member of the Planning Commission, if you read through the uh, phase one bylaws that we are working on still, um, you'll notice that under short-term rentals, it's relatively quiet. And there's a reason for that. And that reason is that it's hard to make decisions in a relative vacuum. And so what this will give us in general is more data. So I'm in full support of this because I think that we do need data to the point that you can find this data on existing commercial, private, for-profit sites online. I have tried that. It's relatively ephemeral. It's not systematic. It's not repeatable. The methods uh, for gathering that data are very scattershot. It's very easy to miss the whole picture. Um, there is a website called AirDNA, which purports to have better data than that. Um, the state of Vermont does pay for that. We do have some access to that data. It's still not that great because it's essentially scraping from these other websites. And so again, your method for getting that data is ephemeral. You don't really have control of the methods. And so that's data that I look at as someone who believes in the power of assessing quantitative data. And I kind of go, hmm, grain of salt. I'm not going to trust that fully. It gives me an idea. It maybe gives me a snapshot. <coughs> but it doesn't give me a great, a great picture. And so I really think that this is worthwhile for information gathering. Again, to Tom's point earlier, it's hard to make a decision in a vacuum. We need data to make this. We need to inform our select board. Because if the planning commission is sitting here saying, listen, we can't fully make a decision on this within the bylaws, we really want some support from the select board to come up with some idea of how to manage this, they need a foundation on which to build that house. I think this is that foundation. That's good. Hi, my name is Sandy Saban. Um, I wanted to talk, I first let Tom know, um, I, you all know that I'm trying to build an ADU, and um, I had a fire marshal knock on my door because I had done a zoning permit, and also had my electrician put in a permit to put in the electric, electricity. What, probably the reason why you don't hear about ADUs being rented is because the fire told, fire marshal told me that you cannot rent an ADU. So, yeah. He said, if it's, a, if it's rented, he said you can build, you can put the bathroom in, you can put the bedroom in, you can put a kitchen in, but you can't rent it. 
it falls under a commercial property and it falls under the all the regulations that fire marshal has for regular rental so that may be why they're not reporting that they're renting it and i can give his name so because i didn't know that either so even though vermont housing improvement program has that this fire marshal won't allow it so that may be why they're not saying they're renting it um, my understanding is um, it would likely qualify as a public building. Um, I don't believe fire marshal inspections are a requirement of public buildings. Perhaps if you're receiving the state money, they no, they have nothing to do with that. He said you have a permit for an ADU. He said it can be an, an ADU cannot be rented. I mean, I can give you his, he's, the, he's the assistant fire marshal for the state. I've never heard I that. I, can. I looked up the regulations and if you look it up, he's right. You have to put in, you have to put in everything that you, all, everything that qualifies as a, he called it a duplex. And I said, it's not a duplex. I have the same, you know, the door comes to both things. It's a mother-in-law apartment. He goes, if you're renting it, it is not an ADU. And I can send you, I'll actually send you his information. I mean, you can shake your head all day. Tell him that. I mean, maybe he should come here and say it. No, uh, I can't hear uh, I think, it, I, I hear what you say. It's not that you can't rent it, but it's the requirements that are applied to rent it are like onerous, like excessively onerous. So I just want to be clear. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's that you can't rent it it's just the requirements make it so you it, don't rent it. <laughs> no it has to right well that's no, all it has, to, it has to pass all exactly it has to uh, the fire code it has every single person not only that level code. but your love the entire house has to pass yeah well, not just that the entire house if it's entire attached. house it's attached. Yeah. it was attached yeah Even, yeah it was being built in my basement so okay. Huh. I, I just have a question. I, I'm not. I did read this, but I haven't been as active as any other thing. But one of the things I'd be curious about is the question that you asked for a questionnaire is who actually owns the building. And I'll tell you why. It was at, right after um, COVID. It was um, maybe some of you know that that Morgan Stanley bought a bunch of houses in New Hampshire, Maine, and Vermont. And, and they're a stock group with, for investors, and they Airbnb them. So it would be very interesting to know, you know, are there individuals that are just trying to pay their taxes to make ends meet, or is this like corporations doing this for stocks? Because that needs to be approached. I'd like that data to go to the state of Vermont and other places because it's taking homes away from people who live all their lives. Uh, she just, yeah, she's, she's suggesting that we, uh, on the registry questionnaire, that we ask who owns the home, so you can determine whether it's a corporation, an individual. So now, see, is it? Yeah. So, his name was Stanley Baranowski. Yeah. He's the owner. Yeah. He's very hard to get. We had to do with him. <laughs> uh, other comments? Any anyone online? the question or comment? Yes, Mary. I just, as a person who rents an ADU, I would be very happy to register that rental property. Hmm. I hope you do an Agnes ordinance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say that <clears throat> when proposed this um, ordinance proposal was quite a bit larger and we took all the input and we just kept cutting things away and cutting things away and cutting things away and then we just have the bones and I think every complaint we heard we listened to and we cut we cut sentences away words and sentences were cut away and now what we've got is just just the registry nothing else right not a whole lot else just registries no fees the 
to speak to the owners of short-term rentals in the room. The rep a representative, the president, what was she of the alliance? Uh, Are you representative? Are you a spokesperson for the short-term rental alliance? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, endorsed it. So we have crossed every T and dotted every I. And I think what we're left with is a good product. <laughs> and, and if I yes. just don't want to say one final thing to Sandy's point, um, the very first draft that was presented had had language for the ordinance, but also just had commentary that I put in. And one thing I did note actually was um, a few other towns have a requirement in their ordinance that to complete complete the registry, um, you also have to have your signed certificate from the state fire marshal. So that's that wasn't in here on purpose, and, and in essence, my commentary was to say that's the state's business, and and we don't need to get involved in their business. We can just do our own. Um, so just want to. That's not something we're a part of. Mm -hmm. So can I just say I'm not against the short. I'm not against this at all. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm against some of the wording, and I do still have some questions as to like what exactly is considered. Um, a day is that 24 hours is that overnight for the 14 day I'm just wondering a lot because I have rented short-term rental for three days but it was actually four days if you're talking about overnight it was three nights is it but I you know they didn't check until three and they had to be out by 11 so it wasn't 24 so that's just little things like that like the 14 days I mean, I don't have a problem if I have a short-term rental doing a registry. I, don't, I think that's, I told all my neighbors that I was having somebody over. I don't have a problem with that. I mean, I just, and to Kane's point, you guys have done a lot of work on this, but I still think there's a few things that need to be tweaked to make sure that everyone understands what, it, what the purpose is. And I do understand that we need to know. I mean, I want to know if my neighbors are renting, and that's why I told them. You know, I thought that was important for them to know. But, um, you know, there is a few definitions that should be looked at. Tom, does, yeah. the, does the attorney define uh, what a day is? Uh, no, <laughs> but we can, we can certainly add that if desired. Um, I, in my mind, a day is 24 hours, and that's my working definition of the term, so I didn't think to add it. But I, would, yeah. I would imagine that that is also a court's yeah. definition of the term. Yeah. So if I only, if I, sorry, should mm -hmm. I? Yeah, go ahead. If I rented at 3 o'clock and they were out by 11, then it wasn't a day. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Alan? This clarification, uh, section five, number one, second sentence, a person should not commence the use of a dwelling unit as a short term or long term unless and until the RPA issues the requisite rental registration. Is in that sentence person the owner? Yes. Okay, why can't we say owner? Uh, we can. Sure. Just a suggestion. Do you want It's a good suggestion. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? Company. All right. Uh, all right. I have a suggestion that we change uh, section five, uh, uh, number one, second sentence uh, to from a person to an owner. Thank you. I want to go see my son. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. Um, do you need a motion? Yeah. Okay. I move to amend the second sentence of section five, the first paragraph of section five to replace the phrase, a person with an owner. Okay. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? 
Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. So in the amended uh, draft ordinance, uh, we have made that uh, amendment. Dave? Yeah, um, section five, uh, number two, all rental properties shall have a designated responsible person who is available to <clears throat> and authorized to respond to emergency situations. You know the rest of that. Um, yeah. So as a landlord, I do all my own maintenance and my tenants call me directly if something happens. Yeah. So if this is a registry, if that goes through, I'm that person to contact. Say I'm out of town on vacation mm -hmm. and I appoint a friend of mine to take care of this. Do I have to enter that into the registry so they can be contacted? Or if my tenants know that, is that sufficient? So what will come next if the ordinance is adopted is the registry form itself with those right. questions. So I think the simple answer is um, we might simply ask for a person and a backup. Okay, but it might be more than one person. You may not be able to get that person. Like I call my plumber and he's not available. You have to call somebody else. So, I mean, that's going to be pretty hard to pin down other than the owner. <coughs> Being that person, I just think you might have a situation where, oh, I couldn't get in, get in touch with my friend. I had to call this other guy, so it may not be. I think you know the intent is so, um, really so emergency services can get in contact with someone okay. when needed. There was an earlier clause that put a time component to it. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I think we can deal with that through through the registry, um, through the specific questions we ask, and and. No different than the ordinance. It'll never be quite right. perfect. Sure. Right. And I think we can modify it over time. The beauty of the registry is the registry is just the questions we ask. That can be adopted and amended by the select board separate from the ordinance. So if we're not asking the right questions after the first year, we can make easy modifications. Right. The other thing, Dave, is a lot of people carry these things around. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I'm just saying that if I was called and I'm not here and Joe Smith was my other person to call and he's not available. Yeah. I could call the town and say, this this is the person who's responding. That would be or, great. you know, that's what yeah. I get. And we understand that there are going to be all sorts of extenuating circumstances that we're not going to be able to cover. Right, okay. Exactly. So. All right, any other comments? Do I have a motion to close the hearing on the uh, registry. I move to close public hearing. Not, not a hearing, just a uh, Oh, okay. Oh, it's okay. So we don't have to. Oh, cool. Okay. No. Do, do I have another here? Uh, can I motion? Ask them? Yes, can, yeah. Sorry. Can, no can you put in here that it's 24 hours on the day? Can that be something? Uh, why don't we, yeah. Which uh, okay. section are uh, we talking about? Section 30. Under short term rental 14. Thirty days. Should it say as defined by as twenty-four hours? Isn't yeah. this the fourteen-day thing? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which which number are we on? Section three, the first page, first page, first paragraph. Okay. okay. So uh, fourteen days. <coughs> parentheses twenty-four hours each. Yeah. Or or at the end you'd say a day defined as twenty-four hour period. Do you like people for that one? I think it's right today. Okay. Um, just because I have no problem with defining it all for the definition for clarity. Do we think that will meet the intent? I'm just, as someone who stays in hotels, not Airbnbs, frequently, to be honest with you, check in to check out is not always 24 hours. In fact, it can't be because they don't allow you to check in. Why I have to allow that? So, um, that would be my only, I'm all for you should define it so that we know when we're asking folks to register. And I don't want to. 14 was the threshold from other times. But, right, but I'm just saying that 14 days, if you rented yeah. it, not for 24 hours, but you rented it 14 times. Right. Oh, right, but it's so, def I guess I would say the definition of short-term rental says if you rent it for a period of fewer than 30 consecutive um, days and for more than 14 days per calendar year. So is that consecutive so, 14 days? No, 14 no, days in a calendar 14 year. 14 days a year. So if you rent so, it, if you rent it for nine hours, and then another nine, and then another, eventually you reach, so, you know. So my question is, should the word be fourteen <laughs> times per calendar year? I agree. It should be fourteen times. If that's the intent of fourteen days, days at a stretch, and that's only you only rent it one time. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but then yeah, you're he still renting it for fewer than 30 consecutive days. But his point being, if it's all at once, we're on. Yeah. I mean, we can do that. I, so if you rent I think it, we should be clear about straight, what we would like. You to don't have to be part of the registry. Right, if you rent for fewer than 30 days, you'll yeah. still have to be part of the registry. Okay, this is it's more than definitions. Than definitions. more than 14. More than 14 <coughs> days per calendar year. Yeah. So, so that, years. for so instances... Right. So I only rented it for 13 days in the calendar year. I don't have to be a part of this. That's or that, is true. <laughs> that is true, that definition. Okay. Yeah. That's, what that's a common about. definition used yeah. in other towns and, in fact, in the state's um, yeah. definitions pertaining yeah. to this. Yeah. So I think a date. I think just the define as a 24-hour period should be really the only amendment to this. Do we need a day, though? this 24-hour period? Yeah. Okay. Is that the case where you might run to a family member for a couple of weeks? Right. I think that's what we're talking about. Right. Yeah. It's allowed. That's not considered a shift. If, right. if yeah. this is state language, does it really need our definition? No. In a day, a day would, a court would recognize a day. That's what I'm. It feels kind of sloppy to me, and it almost puts us self in a, ourselves in a bind if we're yeah. trying to argue days and minutes. I actually, I actually agree with you. I agree. Thank you. 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 Just in section three, the definitions where this is. Yeah. Tom, you've seen a lot of three definitions. A lot of the language you've seen like this. The definition of short term rental is exactly the same as every town that has a short term rental ordinance. It's 14 days. Yeah, but that's not what we're talking about. Yeah, right. Yeah, but that's not what we're talking about. We're not going to try to redefine short term rentals just for one. Yeah, I think that's fine. Okay, good enough. Thank you. 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 Thank all right, do we have a motion? I move to adopt the ordinance to regulate the operation of rental properties as amended, with the amendment being section five, first paragraph, section uh, se <coughs> second sentence. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'll second. Move and second. Any further discussion? Um, yeah. I'm noting that as adopted, it includes no fee to register, um, and subsequent fees would need to be adopted by the selector. Just information. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion? Um, also, just noting, I think for next agenda item, I would like to talk about um, public outreach regarding this, just recognizing that it is something that's going to impact a lot of property owners and timing around conveying that information, making sure we have a clear form and clear information about registering to ensure success in rolling that out is going to be really important to the success of this. Fair enough. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Registry carries. Next on agenda item is uh, the uh, special event permit. I apologize for the time we are going over, but I think we've had some good input tonight. Um, and this is. Karen uh, was here and left online at the time. Okay. That I saw. Is she still there? No. No. But she was here. Yeah, there was. Um, and, uh, we have a request from, uh, for a, an event permit for Arts Fest. Do you have a special event permit application? Yes. Yes. I can't wait. I'll save that in a section. Okay. Um, okay. So, yeah, it's still a pilgrim. Um, I know that there have been a couple of issues in regards to traffic re being re redirected. Um, but uh, do we have any comments on this? Yes, Tom. Um, real quick, for section 10, it, I think, um, <laughs> oh, hang on a minute. Um, uh, page three. No, so we on. just have different oh, dates. Page 10. Item 10, like item, 10, 10 page one. item 10 and item 5 have different dates and times. Ooh. 
So I think we just want to make that clear. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I'm assuming. Well, one of them have Friday and Saturday. Are going to have so the Friday is Friday is the 12th, Saturday is the 13th. I think mm -hmm. we just want to. So if the top ones are correct. The bottom ones are just correct. Yeah. 12th and 13th. And then a comment that came to me, um, one from the public, one from the public works director was, um, and I, um, I don't know if the one from the public was true, but I had a comment last year that um, someone directing traffic was uh, underage, clearly a minor. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that should be a clear in any event that if you're directing traffic, you should be an adult. And then public work director reminded everyone directing traffic should have a safety vest, which I think should also be in every one of these events, but mm -hmm. just want to point that out. Yeah. What would your faction say is a little more detail than the vest? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The last, some, the very last page. All signs and road closures are moved towards the MUPCP line. Uh, Karen was online, but uh, apparently uh, our inability to stick to the, to the agenda schedule. Okay, uh, so uh, I'll just note uh, concern, concerns from the public works are that the signs for road closures and detours uh, be yeah, uh, be compliant with whatever MUTCD is, uh, and all traffic control personnel be properly trained and adorned with the proper safety equipment if standing in the right way. Uh, Tom, do you know, happen to know what MUTCD is? Um, yeah, it's <laughs> I am. It's the Manual Uniform Traffic Control yep. Devices. Got it. It's, it's what <laughs> determines the color and the width of stripes and stop bars and turn arrows and signals and all the signs and all that. Everything having to do with traffic control. Yep. Thank okay. You. you must have worked. Thank you. Your That's excellent. Never heard of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> I'm going to remember that forever. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so I guess with that, if, if we were to make that a conditional uh, part of the permit, would we then be addressing all of the concerns brought forward by uh, the two people that you mentioned, Tom? Yep, I think so. It okay. must be nice if it didn't rain. <sighs> rain did affect things last year. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it felt nice. It was hot. For some, but it rained off the band. Oh, kind of. Well, they still yeah. play. They still play. Rock and roll. Okay. The hardcore fans. Um, <laughs> any other concerns about this? This uh, special uh, use permit. Uh, so, do we have a motion? I move to approve the special event permit application for Waterbury Arts Fest with the amended dates on item ten and the, uh, on conditions <coughs> that they meet uh, Woody's requirements. M-U-T-C-D? Yes. Public reporters for us. That's the motion. Comply. Okay. Uh, we have a motion. I'll second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? OK. We have an arts fest. Moving forward, we have a further um, request for uh, from Good Fire for a uh, special event entertainment. entertainment permit. Thank you. And this should take place on the twenty first, uh, five twenty thirty one. I think it's is thirty one. Yeah, five thirty one. Okay, uh, be the last day of May. And then also 614 and then 628 
the 5th of July, uh, the 30th of August, and the 6th of September. Six events. All acoustic? It says acoustic music yeah. on the front lawn in front of signage. Mm -hmm. Same as last time, no drums. No drums. Okay. Can I give a little yes, bit of information? Yes, uh, Karen, could you provide a little bit further information on this? What, what little I know, originally this application came to me for every Friday night <coughs> Memorial Day to Labor Day. But the, and I did not know this, but I was inadvertently stepping on the toes of the Development Review Board by bringing you such an application because you're only permitted to have seven events of this kind without getting, in this case, a change of use. He's not permitted by the DRB, by his, by the function of his business, he's not permitted to have these events. Mm -hmm. So um, thankfully Mike Bishop brought that to my attention, that's why it came off the agenda two weeks ago. <coughs> he's amended it so that he's compliant. He already had one event in April and now he's asking for six more. Um, that's about all I, the only other thing to point out, I guess, is that by filling it out this way, not that I didn't encourage him to do this, just give me one application, please, not six, is there's only one fee, because there's only one application. Um, so, you know, you would potentially approve this type of entertainment for a $25 fee, which is just pointing it out as a fact. Um, and probably he'll be in front of the DRB asking for a change of use so he can continue this type of... I'm a little concerned as a resident of Sunset Drive, now I'm speaking as a resident of Sunset Drive, not loving the idea of live concerts on my streets, um, not loving the idea of potential parking issues, emergency safety, things of that nature, but that's a conversation with the DRB. I'm sorry, are you in a butter? You'll be noticed. <laughs> You'll be able to go in. That's why it goes to them. I think they'll be the first ever combination pot shop and music venue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are you sure? I'm not sure that's the first pot <laughs> shop and music <laughs> venue in town. I, I just want to say as a comment, I visited their location for their um, mm. Eclipse event. Yeah. And I thought it was very well run. I thought, I spoke to them, I thought it was, you know, I, I told them so, I said, you, and, and there they had a rock band, you know, versus a acoustic, acoustic band. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, with everything going on during the eclipse, you know, there was so much going on at Cold, Cold Hollow, you know, and they actually didn't have any parking in their parking lot, all the parking was accommodated across the street, in, I think in Cold Hollow. Yeah. So, yeah. this they is- have a, um, a police and then uh, uh, directing traffic and stopping for the pedestrians to cross the street. There was for that event, but I don't. I, I don't think they're look. They're not mentioning that they're going to do that for this. No, they no. just the opposite. No need for law enforcement. It says. Right. Oh, okay. Well, I do. I, I continue to have concerns about that. It is a busy intersection. There's it a is. lot going on through yeah. there. Not everyone's paying attention. Um, and so if it does happen to draw a crowd that requires parking over at Cold Olive, and we do have pedestrians crossing the street there, I consider it, uh, I would want a uh, uh, MUTCB certified <laughs> person uh, directing traffic. But my experience from the Eclipse event, there was very little, tra you know, the traffic there was minuscule. You know, Even on a Friday night. Yeah, well, well, no, this was Saturday. Yeah, before, but the, I, uh, what I'm saying is this is going to be on Friday night. There are a lot of people that yeah. come right. from places south headed towards a town north, just north of us mm -hmm. uh, on that road. I think that could be true. I think m most of the people on the Eclipse weekend were kind of, you know, it's their one year anniversary. Come check out the place. You know, mm -hmm. there were buzzing, you know, probably a lot of people from out of state who were, you know, Eclipse people, and yeah. I thought they were ran it pretty well. It granted, I don't think, as you said, if they're doing a, a, an evening kind of thing with music, I think with an acoustic kind of thing, I think you're going to see lower crowd levels than a rock kind okay. of thing. Um, would you be 
satisfied to conditionally approve the permit on conditions that they have traffic control? Um, yes. Uh, the, well, I have one other concern, though, uh, which is that I just heard that uh, you can only have six of these events. Seven. Right? Seven, they said. Oh, you can have seven? It seven. makes seven. The six they're That's asking for tonight and the one in April. I know, but didn't you say that the RV said that you could only have six? No, I'm sorry. If I said it, I misspoke. Oh. They can only have seven in a year. Oh, That's why they're asking right, for right, six. All right. Then about, I thought more they were, changing news. again, triggering it. <laughs> but yeah. Um, I, I, I guess uh, I'd be interested to see what sort of crowd it gets uh, and, and then determine if it needs uh, a uh, person directing traffic. Uh, and I would want that person to be recognized because, you know, uh, the person that's not MUTCD uh, recognized <laughs> could get run over. Yeah. The only concern that I would have for requiring them to have uh, crowd, you know, some sort of police or you know, mm -hmm. safety control. We don't require that at Cold Hollow. You know, and Cold Hollow's drawing as much as, you know, they draw as probably more. And this, I assume, than this would be. Yeah, yeah the, the, parking lot. the difference. Yeah, the difference is people, people get to play bouncy cars there. Uh, they're, they're inside their cars, and they pull in the Cold Hollow parking lot. Yeah. What I'm worried about are pedestrians that are not protected by their cars. You're right. And uh, they're much more vulnerable. Great. So, yes, Tom. Um, since I've been here, we've struggled a little bit with all these permits and events, and part of our struggle has been fees. Um, you know, do you, do you charge a fee for, the, for a broader event, like the craft fair in the park? Do you make any, every vendor? And it's been a little bit of a mishmash. We're trying to get better, but I don't think you should charge them a $25 fee for the total. I think it's six events. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just my recommendation is they should pay the same as any vendor would. Otherwise, they're getting a deal, and, and we're trying to just internally to test that we can be really uniform. I agree. This is this is kind of serious, and to me, it's just it's just like you have one event in a weekend. It's different than having multiple events. So, you know, this is six six different events. Um, Do we approve the first D? Yeah, that, that's the way I'm, I'm looking at. We approved the first one for $25. Let's see if uh, what sort of crowd it draws, whether it merits uh, a, uh, pedestrian uh, control, and then uh, we can uh, look at uh, permitting the others. Uh, take forward. I make a motion to approve the entertainment permit for Vermont Good Fire Cannabis on Waterbury Stowe uh, Road uh, solely for the date of May the 31st for, the, for acoustic music presentation. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, they got their permit for the first date. Or actually the second date. <laughs> Okay, uh, moving forward. Um, the traffic. traffic update. Speed bumps, walking safety. Did you want to add to that handicap parking? Yes, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, we wanted to also add to this handicap parking in the downtown area. Has that have been added when we reviewed it? Eh, maybe, but. Are we going to get upset about it? No. Okay. Um, all right. Let's start with uh, let's start with handicap. So I've done a, done a little work um, with the Woodruff. We've um, some challenges to creating handicap spaces. You can make a handicap space, but you really need the curb cut. So we thought oh. logically an easy one, a great one, would be right in front of the senior center on Stowe Street, but but you don't quite have the room in the sidewalk to do it. To, to technically meet the standard for a curb cut. You could do it, it just wouldn't quite be ADA compliant. Huh. And it's not free, obviously. What I did learn is the town actually owns, um, I've got to read the agreement in detail, but, but all or some of the parking lot at the church right here, the Congregational Church. 
The town um, owns that? The town owns that. Um, there's an MOU agreement. Um, yeah, for plowing and parking use after church hours. <coughs> Huh. And so, and, and again, I haven't reviewed that in full, but I, I think I can come to in a couple of weeks, and I think we can um, be in a handicap space there. Yeah, at least. And that's essentially right near the curb and pretty close to the top of the hill. Mm -hmm. yep. So I think that's a that's a good mm -hmm. spot. Yeah. No, there isn't. The space it would be is usually my parking space because it shows at seven thirty in the morning. <laughs> for the church but anyway, so we'd have to more somehow area. get a little creative with signage to make sure it's obvious it's a public space mm -hmm. but I think we can accomplish that okay because you know what? it would get dicey because the parking lot directly behind it is privately owned yeah. right next right. to the cemetery but that one's got signage on it it tells right. you where the right way that you're going to be paying for it right uh, this would be a different one and then there's um there's a private property owner. Um, I'm not. I can go into deep, limited detail, and, and the rest would be for executive session. I haven't been very far in this conversation, but there's a private property owner in the downtown. Um, I guess in prior years, there's been conversations about the town paving the parking lot in exchange for um, having it as public parking, huh. perhaps six days a week. Just give you an indication of the owner, maybe. Um, yeah. And that would also be another option for handicap parking, and also for just increased public parking. And that's not far from 51 South Main, which we'll lose at some point in the next six months, mm -hmm. uh, sooner okay. than that. So I think we're, we've got a couple of good leads, mm -hmm. but but making a handicap space with a curb cut, whether it's Stowe Street or Main Street, is tough. The other piece is um, we are going to uh, stripe Elm Street this year. Uh -huh. Um, I was wondering so, whether Elm Street might have uh, room for a, uh, a spot there. And so we'll, we'll look at we'll look at handicap options there when we get closer and talk with the contractor. Okay. Because yeah, I was on Elm Street today and looking at uh, yeah, I some good prospects. The the complaint about Elm Street from residents is that um, it's since things aren't really delineated that well, they get some conflicts with people blocking driveways. Um, that there is also. Um, there's a hydrant with a yellow curb in front of it, but we still get people parking in front of the hydrant, so hopefully striping will make it more obvious. <coughs> uh, 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 so Mike, you go first. I just didn't know if you had talked to the private owner at TV about us providing payment for those spots that we talked about at the last I think I was charged with doing that. Oh, okay. And, and I'm, I've been, I wanted to exhaust our public options first before we pay money to okay. enter into this agreement. Mm -hmm. Mike, was there any movement, because I know there was some talk about the space right next to Stimson's and Grave, right by the Champlain Farms, and mm -hmm. the handicap parking space there. That seems to be the perfect location for a handicap spot, because that's where it's kind of really needed, right in that core downtown. Well, we're almost across the street if we, if we use the church one. So I think, yeah. I think we're pretty good there. But who, okay. And, the, and who owns, do we know who owns that? Uh, I, I, just got the MLU, I just got the MOU before going into the... Okay. Uh, uh, maybe we can take a look at that one too. Uh, then, uh, uh, just in Front Porch Forum, uh, one, there, we, there was one complaint of people of uh, Public Works stacking snow in the one handicapped spot uh, <laughs> on Big Lake Lane. Uh, can, can that be addressed? That can be addressed. I mean, for the current season, I don't think we have to worry about it. Okay. The, the real challenge there is it's, it's got to go somewhere. Um, they generally are really good at clearing out all those things a day or two after the storm. Um, I, would, I haven't ever had a complaint about those things lingering. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I'm, I'm just not aware of it. So but that, can, that can be reiterated to the, to the public works director and four, and four person that We've got to clear that space as soon as we can. You yeah, to... or you could stack the snow on the other corner. Okay. So you'd have to get a paid loader to move, physically move the snow? Yeah, they do that. Yeah, they do. Time yeah, and then uh, enforcement. Um, there was a complaint that the lot right uh, behind uh, Propig Brewery has uh, a very nice ample uh, handicap parking spot. Mm -hmm. But that it, uh, it's uh, being used by people without a tag. Mm -hmm. um, 
not much I can do about that without parking enforcement. State I can, police ticket. I can relay it to the state police. I don't think they issue the parking tickets, do they? Mm -hmm. I, I think for I think for handicap they can. Okay. I'll double check on that. I mean, they certainly enforce our municipal ordinances. I don't think for normal kind of like well, parking. I mean, is it that is that parking lot ours? Yeah. Yeah. So we contract with a tow company, do we not? We do. So yeah, that seems like a solution to me. Yeah. Hmm. At least a hundred dollar solution. Um, okay, let's. Uh, We've got a couple of follow-ups. We'll be talking more about uh, creating more parking, handicapped parking downtown, but it looks like we're on the path forward there. Um, pedestrian safety. Um, I received a uh, request from Forrest uh, McDonald, who also serves on the uh, disaster uh, task force. Um, about uh, people speeding on Maple Street uh, mm -hmm. near uh, the Triangle. Yep. And uh, I suggested that uh, one thing that we could do more immediately was to move those uh, radar uh, units uh, into that area. And uh, he had a couple of suggestions on places where that could be put. It's not a permanent solution, but it is a somewhat effective temporary solution to get people to recognize, oh, that's me that's causing that thing to blink because I'm going too fast. And uh, then maybe think about those that are more. Um, thanks. Uh, OK, we've got Kane, and then uh, Kate, go ahead. Um, I was just going to say, as someone who lives adjacent to that street, um, you know, it's not, it's not just teenagers ripping down the road like, you know, if you, if you traverse Maple Street tomorrow, you'll see burnout marks all the way down the road. <laughs> that does sound like That was from a funeral. <laughs> oh, nice. That was a funeral. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> Someone looks up in the back. Or <laughs> <laughs> stoked. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, but yeah, there are people, and it's, you know, not at night either. People are ripping down that street, you know, 55, 60 miles an hour in the middle of the day. Um, hmm. So I, I would make a suggestion <coughs> that the, the police department that we contract with do a few patrols up there, and it can be broad daylight because it doesn't matter to the drivers who are speeding whether it is dark or light out. And, uh, or big old speed bumps. They, they have been known to issue citations. <coughs> And they're, they're quite responsive when they get these sort of requests. Mm -hmm. Okay. You, you, get, um, you get the state trooper cruiser sitting there for a couple of days, and they, that mm -hmm. changes things pretty okay. quick. Katie. Um, Katie Gallagher. I live on Maple Street across the street from the fire department. And just to echo Kane's remarks, people are speeding very frequently to the extent that I have witnessed uh, people passing others to speed directly in front of the fire department. They're not speeding fast enough. Right. Mm -hmm. Like at least four times. And that's what I have seen and I've also heard other people coming to my house witness that. And just as a reminder, there is a park directly behind there and so there are also frequently children like on bicycles coming out from behind the fire department so whoever is speeding would not see them pop out. Um, so this has, yeah, certainly been a concern of mine for a long time. Um, and I also wanted to raise separately, although part of this conversation, whether there has been a discussion um, by the select board of any interest in a longer term plan, sorry, I have my biases, um, but to look at um, these different dimensions of transportation needs throughout the town, because while I appreciate any short term solutions in our area throughout the town, I think it would be, it would be helpful to do some data collection um, to fully understand where it would be most useful to, to implement tools like radars or speed bumps or, you know, what are, or, or police presence. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do we still have that um, temporary speed bump? We do. Mm -hmm. We have one in place. Um, so 
I've had a lot of conversations with the public works director about speed bumps or speed humps, and he, he, let me, let me try to choose my words carefully, he, he hates them. <laughs> they're, they're such a nightmare for plow drivers. Yeah, well, even the temporary ones, because we had one on Guptill. Nearly tore my axle off. The, the temporary ones, um, you know, the removable ones, yeah. um, are working it on and off, and they damage the road a little bit. So we don't want from that perspective either. Yeah. So he, if the select board decides to add a speed bump to a road, then then obviously the, the staff will will do it. Mm -hmm. um, but but just to make it clear, I would suggest if you want to go down that road, let's invite him to a future meeting, and <laughs> he can explain and. and Detail for a couple hours is pure hatred of speed bumps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he actually doesn't even like talking about it either. <laughs> um, to get back to the, the more temporary solution, uh, I've noticed that you've got uh, the speed uh, uh, detectors at either end of Main Street right yeah. now. Um, and our experience with them is that they're pretty effective for the first, uh, let's say, month or so, and then people and just, and get to we can just fly right by them and nobody does anything. Yeah. Um, that was off the record. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but you do rotate them around, and you could put one uh, at a, uh, a section perhaps near the fire station yep. uh, on Maple Street. Yeah. Okay. You know that? I'm sorry, Roger. Okay. Yeah, what? That, those are different, though, are they not? Don't we also have the kind with wheels, like the cart kind? We've got a few different types, yeah. yeah. So, Do you like the cart? Oh, I don't care. We've got movable speed. I just, know, these, are like, these are like on posts. Yeah, the ones those are just posts. Right. Yeah. But then I feel like on Maple Street in the past, correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't there one up by the cemetery yeah. a year or so mm -hmm. ago? Yeah, and it was like a bigger. Howard. We had one yeah. on Howard last year for a little yeah. while. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. the wheels stick out into the roadway a little bit. So yeah. if you're trying to pass someone at 70 miles an hour, you're <laughs> doing 55. Uh, I mean, at least in Europe, they just put it. It's a very MUTC <laughs> yeah, exactly. anyway. Yeah, we'll, okay. we'll, we'll have them up on Maple Street. OK. Well, that's good. And we will invite the uh, uh, public works director in to hear more about his uh, <laughs> affinity for speed pumps. Yeah, he, he won't want to do it at 9.30, but... Okay. Uh, Alyssa and then what? Um, just an acknowledgement of Katie's comments and my own bias as well. I do think that <coughs> revisiting more broadly um, pedestrian things, and Chris is going to be shocked I said this, but in my head this could tie to your 10-year paving plan cycle for the town. To me, there's, there's a world in which how we're maintaining infrastructure and modes for cars and bikers and all of the above could be a thing that we look at all together. So I'm just going to propose we put it in the parking lot um, for now to say, um, thank you. Yeah, I know. Ooh, do we actually want to pave it? Um, road and pedestrian safety and maintenance plan mm -hmm. as a future item for us to look at how we address and have a coherent plan for the town. Okay. Good. Uh, one further issue on this, uh, a constituent got in touch with Ian uh, requesting we get uh, one or more of those flashing uh, lights that so when a pedestrian wants to cross, those bright uh, yellow lights go off, uh, alerting drivers to the fact that there's someone that wants to cross the roadway. Yeah, Where, um, on, Main Street. on Main Street. Yeah. Yeah. I told Ian in, in rough numbers 15,000 ish for one of those um, if I stick to that in okay. rough numbers um, yeah. they are solar so the you know, we're not messing with the electrical anything and yeah. which makes it easy um, again in talking to public works director his thought was on the southern edge of town um, you know you've got a straight shot on like the roundabout and that might be a more the most effective place to deploy it. The question is, we have a lot of crosswalks on Main Street. So how many of these are you interested in? If it's um, if it's one, we can take a hard look at the capital budget this year and, and maybe find a way. If it's five, um, we'll probably have to develop some of that into next year's budget. Yeah. I, I, one, can I speak? 
Uh, one one this crosswalk that's uh, always troublesome is right under the, the bridge on the north side of town. Okay. Um, right next to the rotary is a really tough one for drivers and walkers, and a lot mm -hmm. of people are crossing yeah, right yeah. across from Dak Row. Mm -hmm. There, there's a lot yeah, of people. Get out of the circle if it gets time to get the gas. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That might be a great spot for if we do one. I think that'd be an effective spot. Um, Mike. We heard anything more because I know I, I haven't gotten any emails about Little River Road. <coughs> Is well, that they're pretty happy? What? I think they're pretty happy. They got the hugest speed bump. Oh, they're oh, all I'm just curious. They're happy with That's what's happening. Yeah. <laughs> it's good if we hear things from people. Yeah. 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 It's the table. broken axle broke. Yeah. I'm glad two other residents are happy. Yeah. Just to comment on the crosswalk, the, the other real challenge there, um, I might want to make a simple solution a little more complex, I just want to research it. The real challenge there is we've got a storage yard, and when those drivers pull out right in that area, it's it's impossible. Um, they just kind of sort of take a leap of faith and go swell in there in their oh, huge trucks. Right. Yeah. So I'm going to ask Public Works if there's a way to somehow somehow have a sensor or tie those two together so people slow down for our own drivers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just an accident late in the half. And there's a house out there, too. Yeah. yeah. There's a, there's a there. So yeah. some sort of sensor that activates it, I think, would be awesome. I'm just not sure that could be accomplished. Yeah. You're like a foghorn. Really? Just the guy riding shotgun jump out onto the sidewalk. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK. Um, I um, never like to, I'm sorry, Lisa rarely participates, and I think she usually has useful oh. to tell when she has time. Lisa, did you have something to say? One little bit of information on those flashing. Yeah. This is cool. I mean, blush out, I guess. This is just be one of my resident hat. But also, those flashing <coughs> lights that you could get at the crosswalks, there's sure. grants for that. When I was editor of Shelburne, we did a story about the local Eagle Scout who worked on the project to get those flashing lights for the crosswalk that actually flashes and stops the traffic on Route 7 between the park and the building where the town office is and the police department and the school offices are. I mean, that's like high speed, heavy oh, yeah. duty traffic. And they've got the buttons and the, and the things fl and flash, but the, the kid actually worked on the grant application. It was something from AOT. I think there might have been a match from the town um, as part of that, but they didn't end up having to pay the entire 15000 um, for the, the lights. And there's a grant available every year through our insurance, and it's, it's a bit of a gimme. Mm -hmm. um, it's a $5,000 grant, and it's got to essentially reduce our risk. And they, but they won't do, they won't, they'll pay for equipment. Um, they won't pay for routine things like we should buy, you know, safety gear, things yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm going to try to, every year you try to get creative and come up with an idea that meets our standards, and I'm going to see if I can incorporate that, pull out from that driveway in a flashing light. And it's our trucks at risk. Yeah. Never mind the rest of the village there. Mm -hmm. Lisa, do you have contact information for the Eagle Scout? <laughs> <laughs> I'll find the story, I'll send it to you. Okay, okay. good. Right now. I was saying, our downtown transportation fund, which we have as of the designated downtown, that may also be a fun yeah. source. And it's a but 50 he's, percent he's already done it, recreated the wheel of her task. All right. For money. You don't need any uh, directive from the select board on this? I think I have one. Um, proposal for housing trust. Mm. Everyone should have a copy of the packet. Okay. So our last meeting where we discussed the registry ordinance, it included some things that now are, it does not. Um, and the goal of those things, the goal of that regulation that I proposed was to get lower income residents housed in more affordable housing solutions. And I wrote a big proposal that essentially states, though that provision has been cut from that ordinance, the need persists to get low income and working class residents into affordable housing. Um, I actually am going to thank Sandy Sabin for suggesting do what Woodstock does. And I, wrote a, <laughs> and I wrote a proposal that does what, and I took it a step further. I looked into what Montpelier does as well, because they do something very similar. 
Um, and it is essentially starting a housing trust using local option tax dollars, not property taxes, um, to fund an incentive program for landowners to build ADUs. Of course, I wrote this before your fire <laughs> inspection. Um, to build ADUs and apartments um, using you know, grants and, and incentives. Woodstock, they pay a certain amount to landlords to build and to rent for pe build, build units and then rent them to the local workforce with incentives. Um, Woodstock's uh, website had a lot more information than Montpelier's did. But I took what I could from both systems and proposed something I thought would have the best likelihood of passing. The proposal is on page three. The rest is just information about what the other towns did. It's the last paragraph, page three. Okay. Would you like me to read it aloud? Um, that would be one. To create and implement a housing trust fund overseen by a trust fund committee in conjunction with the housing task force and town office funded by the local option tax to facilitate the creation and preservation of below market rate rental housing in the town of Waterbury, to use the fund to incentivize landowners and developers to build, convert, or otherwise make livable rental units for long-term tenants and to provide grants to low-income residents for the purpose of down payments on a new home or apartment. The purpose, of course, is to create and preserve long-term rental options, elevate efforts to maintaining affordability, and maintain a localized workforce. All right. Comments? Dan. Dan Allen. Uh, Waterbury and Planning Commission. Um, I think I stuck around for this specifically because of the discussion that we had earlier regarding single family dwellings and housing options, et cetera, et cetera. And I think this is really uh, germane right now because we're creating incentives to do what we want to do, which is try to increase housing density. Um, you know, there are a lot of different ways of getting at that. One is by allowing for it, which is what the bylaws have attempted to do, allow for that type of development. Um, the initial impetus behind that larger discussion we had earlier tonight was, well, wait, what if we set a denser pattern by default by not allowing certain uses? Um, that's one way of getting at it. And then this is something that I've certainly thought about a lot in with respect to that bylaw change and a, a lot of the things that we've talked about with our zoning update is how do we incentivize this? Um, because we need a carrot and a stick sometimes. And so here's the carrot. And so I think this is really timely um, and I'm definitely in support of something like this. So whatever form it ultimately ends up taking, however the sausage gets made. So I think it's really good that you're talking about this. Great, thank you. Katie. Um, Katie Gallagher, uh, as a member of the Planning Commission, I'm a representative to the um, Housing Task Force, and I'm just wondering, um, I, I fully support a housing trust fund. I've seen it work in many other communities and think it's, it's great. Well, what I'm wondering is, uh, <clears throat> if it should be left to the housing task force to decide ultimately, or at least to do some more research as to how those funds should be used. My immediate thought is that there are existing incentive grant programs through the state for these uses. And while we know that things are ridiculously expensive right now and any additional funding is, is helpful, are there other ways that we might be able to use it to leverage that a little bit more is my, is my only thought. I, I think that, it, sorry, I think it's great. I think we can <coughs> create it. Um, and I think it is just a question of having a clear policy about how we use it. And I think there's, um, so I thank you, Kane, for pushing it forward. And um, I will also just be the one to throw out that I think we have our money that is in our 
general fund balance right now and to me thinking about seed funding it's something we have used ARPA funding for before you know we provided funding for 51 South Main Street as I recall we had 200,000 that was going to be for the reappraisal but we actually already saved enough to cover a reappraisal um, so to me there's also an option where something like that could be the seed funding for this I think us as a board clarifying it our intent around wanting to support a housing trust fund and its purposes and then kind of as Katie recommended or as Kane is noting those examples from other communities subsequently coming up with here's the policy and allowable use you know Montpelier had a particular focus around families and housing not just affordability um, in particular metrics I think that's all things we can work out I think the bottom line is it's important um, also germane to tonight's discussion it occurs to me that some folks might have lots that are a little more complicated to fit in extra house on um, and is there support for legal fees or waiving fees that could be part of this as well so just say, I think there's a whole collection as we said a whole collection of things we could do with funding to support this I think ARPA would be um, potentially useful to start the fund. I think the local option tax makes a lot of sense moving forward, recognizing we haven't implemented this yet. Housing was an allowable use in the policy we adopted. Um, I think that the how much and what can be a down the road discussion, but I think the bottom line is creating the trust and setting it up is a great idea to get all that moving. Mm -hmm. Mike, I agree with a lot of King's premises about the housing trust fund. I do disagree with do we need a housing trust fund here in, in Waterbury. There are organizations such as Downstreet that can be used. You could set up a, within their organization a, a, like a Waterbury committee that will help do things. I, 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 I saw this when I was on the Waterbury Conservation. There, there was a big rush to we needed to have a Waterbury Land Trust. And even I worked with um, the, you know, Heather Furman, who was then director of the uh, Stoll Land Trust, mm -hmm. and she says, we could do everything you want. You know, we have all the expertise, you know, and that's where um, I have real concerns is you have all these organizations that recreate themselves. Downstreet is a professional already at this. You know, I don't think every town in Vermont needs their own housing trust. I think Downstreet, you know, is a regional organization. They can help us <coughs> meet Kane's needs without formally creating a trust right here within within the community. Just my thoughts. But do they have this do they do they address these purposes right here? I think I think they could. I think if you went into conversations, but I say if you really have a regional housing organization and they can have sub, and I've seen this, and you know I've been in the housing business for years, you know, you could have subgroups out of a larger regional housing organization that will help a community do what they want without necessarily create. Creating, I always say, you know, why create another bureaucracy? That's my thought. Uh, I got Ian and then Kate. Do you want someone to go also? Oh, I was just saying, yeah. as a point of information, a Waterbury Land Trust was created for needs that were not served by the Stowe Land Trust within the past three years. So it, there's yeah. a use case in some scenarios. Yeah. Um, and I would <laughs> say anecdotally, I think talking with Downstreet first, as Katie alludes to, to around existing state and regional programs, I mean, they are already offer down payment assistance that can support exactly. Waterbury homeowners. As you know from USDA Rural Development, there is some pretty stringent federal requirements and I just think about needing to go to a subcommittee of the downstreet board to get approval for <coughs> an edgy new program that's you know providing um, rent security and so I guess I want to be mindful of our municipal staff and certainly not want to unnecessarily duplicate but I could see a use case for different programs so I don't know if maybe there's a next step around understanding what they could support but I just feel like it's likely that there is problems programs that do go beyond their scope right. and purview. I think it's willing, it's at least a good thing to start that conversation to see if they can meet that niche. If, if they can't do what we want, I'm all for the housing trust. Yeah. Uh, you satisfied? Yeah. No, I'd just like to say one thing. I kind of want to 
uh, echo you know Dana's comments about housing is obviously such a huge area of interest for this town. I think investing thought, time, and potentially dollars makes a lot of sense given the the heat around this this um, particular uh, you know part of our town. And I, I do think this this reads very nice. I like this idea of creating um, a housing trust uh, with these particular goals. My one question that maybe is in here that I'm not quite finding is how that application process might look um, for these funds. Can you can you speak to that, Kane? Um, I couldn't find. Well, I could find, but it was very 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 long application project. Uh, application for Woodstock's system. Woodstock has four different systems, four different applications. Right? They have home share. They have incentives. They have. Are you renting to a local um, employee? Right. There's all sorts of things, um, but I think what they did best was. I think their system works, or at least when I was on the phone with them, they said the one part of our system that works the best is the ADU incentives, and they were shelling out quite a bit of money to keep people who worked in their town housed in their town, and. Essentially, the application process was someone, for example, right? I don't, I don't have my notes from that conversation on me right now, but that, for example, landlord has an apart or has a garage. They build an AU above it. The town hucks them a pretty substantial ch chunk of change to get that up to code and get it livable, and on the condition that they rent it to a local employee or to a local worker. Yeah. Right. So I would assume that an application product, uh, an application that we create would include those requirements, right? Right. Thank you. One, one, one real quick note. Um, through eFund, there's a loan fund, right, which now has uh, the ability to serve the whole town. It's for businesses that's in the loan terms, but an apartment, an ADU is oftentimes a business. Um, the loan fund procedures don't say for a homeowner, um, so it would have to be a business, but if a business applied for a loan to do some renovations, to you know, renovate a building, make apartments, that sort of thing, it would be an eligible use. So there's some capital available now, not highly advertised, but there's a few hundred grand out there that could be used. I just wanted to, to make that point. Um, one thing I just want to comment on too in the proposal section. Um, I worry a little bit about the trust fund committee, only because the town has an awful lot of committees. And I think, his, at least since I've been here, there hasn't been a lot of challenges staffing those committees, getting volunteers. Mm -hmm. um, but I, um, it can be a challenge. Yep. Um, so I, I just maybe, maybe suggest you apply it to an existing committee or just think a little more. A little differently about that. I guess I would ask the housing task force if that's something that they'd be willing to take on. Because if not, we'd have to go back to the drawing board. I would also think um, I want to have a conversation with Revitalizing Waterbury. Um, would it be something for them to yeah. consider at some level? They they have their finger on the pulse. I think they, some of these issues. Uh, Billy, uh, yeah. yeah. Right now we have. First of all, I think the idea of trying to help some people and improve the housing, obviously, is really important, and I stand behind it, as you've heard me way too many times tonight. But there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of things that are changing. And the one thing that makes me scratch my head is, five to 10 years from now, all of the seniors that we keep talking about won't be here. And so really? the housing, people are going to move on. Okay. Right. Um, and so as the elderly population, as the rules that we just, that you guys are going to pass change, as the state deals with this, there could be a time where we want to measure the efficacy of the program and may not want, need it anymore. And I guess I'd strongly encourage a system that monitors and examines how well it's working and then at some point checking in, do we need it? Uh, because I just think with all the moving parts, with any luck, we're going to actually solve this problem in a, in a better way than having a housing trust. Mm -hmm. okay. so. uh, Joe, Camerata, 
Uh, you didn't have your hand up, I but uh, <laughs> you are. <here. laughs> and you happen to be the chair of the uh, Housing Task Force. Have I you? happen to be the chair of the Housing Task Force, but the Housing Task Force has not discussed this, so right. I would not commit the task force to taking this on without first bringing it before the task force to have that discussion. So, mm -hmm. and if you would like, I can do that. Um, um, but I have a couple of other points too besides that. Yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah. Um, I think one other point, you know, we, we discussed earlier the whole topic around why we want to have this rental registry and what we want to do with the information and the concerns about regulations. And we, you know, we combine that with the improved density that will come from the proposed bylaws, we still we still need some way to get people to invest into longer term housing. I mean, because the allure of the short term rentals are so great as we heard here tonight, right? And this is uh, this is it. I mean, this is what Dana was saying, right? This is the carrot that really kind of gets people and says, we're interested in this, we want you to in invest this way, we're willing to work with you to, to build out that way. The second thing I would say is that if we look at, and we're putting this information together for more of a public presentation, but right now we have a lot of really cost burden, um, both renters and homeowners, especially senior homeowners here. So we might want to think about, you know, even bringing that piece into that. Like, what are the requirements of the housing? And if it is ADUs, which it could be, it could be, you know, but should they be done in a certain way that accommodates people, not just local workers, but might also support a senior who's living in the community who wants to maybe move into a place that's more walkable and then freeze up a single family house. So I think that should also be part of the school. Okay. Thank you. Um, Chris. So like any new revenue source, uh, it's looked at by many people as like fish pellets being thrown into a stock pond. Everybody's after it. I'm curious to know a little bit of more, more nuts and bolts about this trust. Kane's talking about some pretty serious money. I'd like to know what that means, throwing it at landlords to upfit a piece of property. Um, what percentage of that local options tax would be used towards this trust? Is the trust in any way, shape, or form being reimbursed financially through this process? Other than keeping employees here, Kane has spoken quite a bit tonight about employees having to come from out of town to work in restaurants. Well, I can tell you my business, there's hordes of contractors coming into this town every day taking the money that's here and bringing it back to their town. That's a part of life. That's a part of the way the process works. Uh, to try to corral one group of people to stay in town uh, while the rest of the town is dealing with exactly what you explained earlier, uh, doesn't really align with me too well. So I'm interested to know, you know, this local options tax, as I had stated way back, that I hope it's looked at by the select board as a surprise revenue source every year, <coughs> because if it doesn't, if it's not looked at that, it'll just be become part of the norm, and it will be, be gobbled up like fish pellets in a stock pond, uh, and you won't, you won't accomplish hold the potential to not accomplish some really serious goals if, if it gets diluted too much. Uh, Elizabeth? I can speak to that. So when we had added the provision, or when I had asked for a provision to be added to the registry ordinance that regulated rents to keep workers here, there was a whole room of pushback, right? Nobody wanted regulation. Nobody wanted that kind of regulation. And so I went that night, I went back to the drawing board, and I was like, well, nobody wants regulations, but we still have a problem to solve. So, you know, 
governments really do two things. They regulate and they throw money at stuff. And so you guys didn't want regulation. <laughs> so my solution was to throw money at it. Mm -hmm. I feel like in the interest of the hour, I would move, I would just say, I think Montpelier's is very excellent. And just to your point, Billy, it does have very clear parameters around making grants or loans to eligible applicant, helping 10 eligible households, facilitating the creation of 10 new apartments annually. So I think you can create similar benchmarks for the community. Again, that might be something for the housing task force or for us to look at. Um, they also have pretty clear set thresholds to per some of like what Chris and others were talking around saying like up to 10,000 for a unit if it will help X amount of folks or you know just different recognizing you know you could do one project we know that run hundreds of thousand dollars individually and that could be the whole pot at once so I think the goal would be to figure out what are strategic ways across a variety of programs to support things. Um, and this is a first conversation. So also acknowledging, again, there's a whole spectrum. Some towns have it where it's, again, direct subsidizing of existing, some it's on creation. I will note this is one of the few places we see some of the home ownership stuff, noting that some other folks do it too, but locally as well. Um, I will move that the select board um, encourage the we should figure out next steps in terms of reaching out to Downstreet around their available programs and ability to take on a loan fund and the housing task force around potential um, desirable incentives and have a follow-up conversation as a board among with that second set of information. You just That's made a, a motion. Yeah, it was a motion. <laughs> I move. I'll start again. I move that the Town of Waterbury Select Board continue to research options for a housing trust fund, including contacting representatives from Downstreet Housing and Community Development um, about their interest and ability um, to about their current home ownership offerings and ability to manage a local loan fund and ask the housing task force at their next <coughs> meeting to brainstorm potential uses of a housing trust fund. And we discuss this at a next meeting. I'm sorry, it's awkward to do as a motion. I'm just talking. <laughs> <laughs> if you kind of right there, it might be OK. Great. And Karen's next four, 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 four. I was just saying, I'll email you. I, I cannot control the time. I can cut down the street. Doing a motion to do more research. OK, that's a motion second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, so pass. <laughs> Not that hard. Um, let's move on to animal control ordinance. Preliminary discussion at a uh, few minutes before 10. So oh, it's actually 10. What were two behind? I did not include um, sort of the track changes of the new versus old. The old is old enough. It's in an old format. And doing that was just couldn't get it done in time. Yep. The, not a lot of changes between the new and old, but I wanted some clarity. So the, uh, the first big change is highlighted in the first page. Um, well, let me step back. Um, I guess in my, my time here, um, Ian hasn't seen one yet, but we've had a couple of vicious dog hearings. Mm -hmm. um, we've probably had um, a half dozen that um, have come to me in the absence of an animal control officer, and they've been dealt with neighbor to neighbor. Mm -hmm. um, usually what I tell people is um, you always have the right to a hearing, um, but I tell the person who owns a dog that caused the infraction that it's I think in everyone's interest to not be go not, not be go be go before the select board and to just neighbor to neighbor try to yeah. figure it out. If some chickens got killed, offer to replace the chickens and and buy a few bags of feed or do something. But usually that's the best way. Mm -hmm. uh, so with that as background, um, the other array of complaints are um, haven't really had a whole lot of noise complaints. It's mostly dogs running wild. Um, so we don't have an animal control officer. Um, it's been a struggle to try to find one. We had one for a little bit. I understand it's been a challenge for the long term. Um, so this ordinance uh, clearly makes the manager, the ACL, in the absence of, of one. Um, <coughs> it also, can I just note, right now we appoint the <coughs> ACL, and this is proposing you do that, which, to be clear, I have no, which is uh, no objection. With, it is consistent great. with the charter. It is great to be by our charter. 
The second piece, the second item for discussion uh, that I think is significant is on page th page three, um, related to cemeteries. Uh, so the Cemetery Commission, some years back, um, voted to take down the no dogs allowed, uh, take down the signs in the cemeteries. Um, they, they had a meeting a month or two ago and they actually had a concerned resident who wanted them to put the signs back up um, and, and he basically said, you know, if a dog does its business, that person who's in that grave can't speak for themselves anymore. We ought to treat the cemeteries with a little more respect. Um, the commissioners said, um, you know, signs are not people have historically walked their dogs in the cemeteries and, and they, you know, I haven't had a single complaint about dogs in cemeteries. Um, let me step back. I have had a couple complaints about dogs in cemeteries, just about the presence, not about leaving waste. And our, our crews maintain them and I've asked them a few times and they, they haven't noticed a problem. But, but I think you had a valid point. Um, cemetery commissioners, I think, didn't agree. I think agreed that he generally had a valid point, but they basically said that um, they view it as a select board matter. So I highlighted that section because um, they're really agnostic on whether or not dogs are banned from cemeteries. They view it as your purview. Um, you know, and again, enforcement's tough on an issue like this. Mm -hmm. um, the other issue, um, the other real change, um, pertains to the clerk. Um, the clerk does licensing. And so I thought, and I think I think the court agrees that um, the animal control officer can can issue warnings and fines. The court also would have that ability in the only pertaining to unlicensed dogs. So the court's not the ACO, but she's sometimes aware of, of these issues. And any before any fine would happen, there'd be every attempt to avoid them. Um, but I think that's one of the consistent problems. And a classic example, and this has probably happened to me five or six times, I get complaints about a dog running wild from neighbors, call the owner, and the first thing I, look, I do before I call the owner is find out if the dog is licensed. Um, in the past, without an ACO, you now that generally just said, we'd like you to come get a license, but without the ACO, there was no clear authority to fine. In those instances, I think I would say, let me give you a week because um, I've already had, you know, a bunch of complaints from neighbors, and I think after that week, I'm going to give you the 50 bucks. Um, Cork would also be able to say that, and I think that's fair. It's a, what, a $12? $11. $11 license fee. Harder. But I think in the instance when you've already annoyed your neighborhood, um, giving that ultimatum is pretty reasonable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's cheaper than a meal at McDonald's. Cheaper than a meal at McDonald's. <laughs> you know that? Yeah, actually, it might be no dollar dollar there's, there anymore, man. there's some legislation that there the state, right. state wants it's to pay two more dollar. bucks. <coughs> yeah. So uh, they going up to thirteen next year? No, I, like I, dollar I dollar. think that the fees are the fees are are assigned from the select board. Mm -hmm. um, so I may be coming to you to ask you to increase them because they're going to take two bucks out of my six. Why do why do they have interest in dogs? They don't. I think it's to fund a endangered species or something. It has nothing they, to do with it. They actually, uh, there was a bill this year proposed to have the state take over this function oh. and to, have, to give it to Fish and Wildlife. Mm. And, I think so they and, ran in the other direction. What I, said, what I said to the <laughs> League, wildlife or fish. You know, <laughs> what I said to the League of Cities and Towns, who's our lobbyist on these matters, was I think that's great. And, and I think, um, I think from my perspective, if the town had to pay you know, five or ten grand a year to to fund these new positions. I think that's money well spent. I think it should be a. I'd love it if it was a state function. Whether or not it should be is irrelevant. But mm -hmm. sure. I think we'd be happy to be, be rid of some of this uh, responsibility. So no, no, no sea changes here. The schedule of fees is on the very back. Um, the odd occasion is when things get expensive, as if, a, if an animal has to be boarded. Um, in that case, the fee is 20 bucks per day, which is the town's fee, and then before the animal is released, the individual pays the town fee and all the boarding fees. Mm -hmm. 
Those are fourthly rare instances, or hasn't been one of those since I've been here. So you're looking for guidance from uh, the board on these three issues, uh, fees, or, or, and court? or any other issues that you want to raise? Um, to me, the cemetery one's easy. I think I don't see why there shouldn't be a ban because I know people who are going visiting their loved ones. If people are walking their dogs, you know, potentially peeing on monuments. I just think that's just it's just not an appropriate place for <laughs> dogs to be. I was going to go the other way. I, I love dogs. You know, I'm a dog lover. Mm -hmm. You know, I hunt with dogs, you know, but I just don't think a cemetery, and there's plenty of places, you know, you know, quiet paths and stuff like that to walk your dog. And to me, the cemetery is just not an appropriate spot, in my opinion. The, the, uh, the cemetery commission, <coughs> they don't have any problems with dogs. Um, not quite. I no. think what they said is they, they really view it as, as, as your authority. Okay. Mm. They, they, they prefer they, not to be in the business of enforcing this ordinance. Okay. So the problem is that the, the ordinances that we have banned on, they don't want to have to enforce it. Right. So are we rolling it back? Well, I don't, you know, uh, of course, I, I have the bias of being a dog owner, uh, and uh, sometimes I will go on my way down to the river. Sometimes I'll cut through the backside of the cemetery. I haven't noticed my dog being disrespectful. Uh, there are several room. cats that roam the cemetery. Well, the cat thing, that was Pete, uh, the animal control officer's big thing, but we're not talking about that. <laughs> That's off the table. Talking about dogs. Uh, so. I, I don't know. I, I could see that uh, we would uh, absolve them of the responsibility of enforcing the ban just by eliminating the ban. How, how come in, in your memo, Tom, it says, I also, I, I also don't think the cemetery commissioners think the ban should be in place and the sign should go back up? Yeah, they, um, they had. That was that's what the meeting was about. Right. Um, they. Um, that's what it sounds like. That's what their recommendation is. I, but they want the signs to go back up, but the band to come off. So. <laughs> it's just misworded. I understand what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, I don't. What's that? It goes both. It sounds like it's going both ways. Yeah. yeah. What, 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 what they don't. They don't want the signs up, and they don't want the band. That's how I read it. Which it sounds good to me. Yeah. I would say the sign should go back up. If, I think that don't think didn't apply to both the start and the end of the sentence. Maybe I worded it poorly. Okay. Okay. But in general, it's not that they so much have a strong position. They more just wanted to push it to you. Right. Mm -hmm. Our decision. Yeah. I would agree there's not a lot of, you know, from the, the maintenance facilities that are maintaining those, I feel like they have a better outlook than anybody else will come in contact with about, is this a problem? And I think it's the first time I've heard of a potential ban of dogs in cemeteries, so it doesn't seem like it's, I'm, not, I'm looking at front porch forum and I'm not seeing many things about dogs urinating on graves, which I do find, you know, I understand the pushback there, but I don't think it's a big issue for our community. I don't think we're, no. Did we start putting up um, leash ordinance signage yet? Did we agree to do that? Was that the last? No, we haven't put that up. No. Would no. that be a solution? Or it would be more relevant to the next uh, recreation playing field. It could, but uh, the real issue is should we allow dogs on leash right. to uh, go with their uh, dog owners or uh, caretakers into cemeteries? And sometimes that's done uh, you know, just as a way of paying respect to. Uh, the uh, folks that were that are in the cemeteries. Uh, yeah, I, if, if the commissioners don't think it's a big deal, I don't think it's a big deal. I think it should be allowed. I move that we lift the ban on dogs in cemeteries. Second. Moving we'll seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor say aye. Aye. aye.
Any opposed? Nay. <coughs> One opposed? Uh, any abstentions? Okay, motion carries. So that's in the... I say in subsequent in the, drafts. <laughs> in subsequent drafts. Yeah, right. Um, and do you need guidance on uh, fees? Or uh, having problems with the proposed fees? Um, Tom, do you find these fees to be acceptable? Um, yeah, generally unchanged. Mm -hmm. And we may, as uh, our clerk told us, uh, we have to address this uh, fee if the state goes after another $2. Yeah, the, 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 real, the real change to the fee section is the, um, the old ordinance defines the hourly wage um, and hourly just changes, so I just defined it as essentially what person we're paying now. Yeah, great. Okay. Karen, mm -hmm. do you antidotally know how many dogs we might have that are not registered around town? No. Half. Yeah. I've heard you, half you think that that many dogs are, are unlicensed. That's what, that's what I've heard around town. Doesn't surprise me. I mean, how many dogs do you think are in Waterbury? So, 12 at least. <laughs> there are a lot of them. There's only about 320 dogs licensed right now. There are a lot more than 300 dogs. I bet you they're close to 1,000 dogs. Yeah. There are like yeah. six living in that one house. <laughs> yeah, they're gone. Yeah, they're they gone. left. They're oh, they did. By the way, I think those got licensed. Right? Oh. <laughs> so we got to count those a little bit of license. But I think that's the reason why we're talking about half of those people who aren't paying anyway. So, uh, and I guess the other issue we're looking for guidance on uh, the clerk uh, being uh, uh, authorized to issue uh, fees to unlicensed dogs after yeah, issues, uh, uh, efforts have been made to get them licensed. And it's just the authorization, so, so the ACO or the manager in the absence would also have that authority, so mm -hmm. there's no obligation on the part of the clerk, but it's the, um, it's the ability. Yeah. yeah, I mean, to be clear, I'm not going to be on social media looking for unlicensed dogs and sending out letters. <laughs> in all your spare time? <laughs> if just I on Instagram that, looking for looking for callers? Yeah. Yeah. No caller. Look at that. But, but if there's a the situation that comes to me, I had a call today. Excuse me, I him stop by. A gentleman stop by today. Apparently, there's two dogs. You mentioned you didn't get a lot of complaints or noise. Uh, these two dogs are put out during the day. Mom, dog mom goes to work and the dogs just are out all day barking. You mean Billy's? <laughs> no, Billy's dog. Billy, really, you're out all day barking? So, oh, oh, oh. and I, those the dogs are not licensed. So he's brought to my attention that there's these two dogs. I consider that a complaint. You know, I would, with mom's help, perhaps write a letter. We received this complaint. Your dogs are not licensed. I, I don't know what enforcement we have over the dogs barking and dogs bark, but um, I can definitely stir They don't them. bark if you leave them inside and feed them. Yeah. Um, those are situations I guess Tom and I have to talk it out and decide how we're going to address them. But one way would be to send a letter that says the dogs aren't, aren't licensed. Mm -hmm. And yeah. hopefully keep it all civil. I don't want to be in the middle of people's neighborly disputes about their dogs or defecating or anything. I, I'm not, if, if it turns that, into that, I'm going to come take back to you and this? say, take it back. I don't want it. Didn't we just elect you for three years? <laughs> yes, <laughs> dog defecating was not in my job description. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> it sounds like it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's a, I think it's a great case where we, where yes, one of us will make a call and just say, I'm going to give you a week. You yeah. mentioned our leash ordinance and in yeah. regards to the cemeteries. My concern is, that what about dogs along, you look out along the path down by the river, between the cemetery and state complex? Right. That is the mm -hmm. cross the Mont Trail, mm -hmm. which is hiking and biking. Right. If dogs are on there, aren't they supposed to be on leashes? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Anywhere in the town. It's yeah. not widely known by dog owners. And a lot of dogs, I encounter yeah. them all, almost every time I walk there, I encounter an unleashed dog. Right. Most of the time they ignore me, which is fine. Mm -hmm. uh, today was one example. The first time this year I took the bike out. Sure enough, I encountered a dog that was not on a leash. The dog ran up to me. I made a comment to the owner. I said, by the way, there's a leash ordinance. I said, oh, it's an electronic leash. That huh. I don't care if it's electronic. I want to see a physical <laughs> leash between the hand and the collar. Oh, yeah, exactly. Otherwise, yeah. I don't care about verbal commands. 
for an electronic leash is the only thing that's effective, to my mind, not being a dog fan, sorry, no offense, but I'm not a dog fan, never have been. Uh, when I see a dog running toward me, I'm thinking threat. And I don't know how to read dog, so my solution is every single dog on that path should be leashed. There's a place in town for, for unleashed dogs, it's down by the ice rink, I will never go down there. Okay. So, I, I'm just thinking first, like two years ago I had a close call with a dog, I was on my bike down by the river, uh, I saw a woman up ahead who obviously had a dog because she was holding the leash in her hand, the dog was in the bushes. I stopped my bike and straddled, waited to see what would happen. The dog came out of the bushes, took one look at me and ran toward me, charged. It was probably 20, 30 yards away, and the dog charged toward me. I got off the bike, held the bike between me and the dog, that was my only defense. She said her attitude was, it was my fault because I was on the bike. My thought was, it's a bike path. You know, <laughs> what do you expect? Uh, but I felt threatened. I had to keep moving the bike around to get between me and, and the dog. Uh -huh. I felt threatened by that maneuver. I reported it to the town. We said, well, we don't have a town or uh, animal <coughs> so Nothing much you can do. I've been told that if I get bitten, I'd report it to my, uh, my doctor's office, which is great, but then it's too late. I'm already been bitten. I don't recognize most dog breeds. Uh, I don't know most of the people that I encounter on the path. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to know, do owners even know there's a dog or a, a leash ordinance in town? Um, <coughs> there have been signs uh, yeah. saying that uh, dogs must be on the leash. Maybe we, <coughs> maybe on, maybe we put they choose to ignore the think We can buy some additional signs and just put them yeah. in a few places around yeah. town. My dog is just the, they may have been taken out by the fence, but there used to be signs yeah. at either end of that path yeah. saying all dogs must be leashed. They, they need more. Yeah. Okay. There's a lot of places to get on the path that aren't from the cemetery or the, you know, down by the state compound. There's other places where you can get on that path. That's true. And in the middle, and you don't see the sign. And then I guess the question for the select board is, to insightful comment, would you like me to develop a definition of leash to include, to be a physical? Yeah, that. probably would be a good idea. Um, I mean, I mean, it's obvious, but uh, as uh, we just heard, uh, some people try to <laughs> create some machinations uh, such that uh, the, the, some sort of electronic gizmo is, is a leash. An invisible leash, like a shock collar? Yeah. That, yeah. Um, I'll give you an exact example. Um, my wife was in the woods with our dog, and another guy's dog was an Akita pit bull mix went and attacked our dog, and he said, well, it had a shock collar on, and I kept on pressing it, and it did nothing. And I, and, and, and and I found that further aggravated. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I found that yeah. about this, and I talked to him. I said, you're lucky that, that your dog, not only you're going to pay for the vet fees, that if it attacked my wife, you would be dealing with me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so a, sh a shock collar, a shock collars are only as good if you have a really good trainer who uses a shock collar that can be very effective. But there are a lot of people who rely, especially with unreliable breeds, <coughs> like Akitas, pit bulls, etc. They can be great dogs, but they're unpredictable. So a, so a more a firm leash is probably recommended. Physical leash. Okay. Physical leash. All right. So what what can I do when I encounter a not leash dog on the path? Uh, you can call uh, the town manager. I mean, considering again, uh, the fact that I don't know most of the people that I meet on the path, and I don't recognize most dog breeds, uh -huh. to me they're either leashed or they're not leashed. And that's the only way I tell one dog from another. Is it gonna, if it's unleashed, is it paying attention to me? Is it coming toward me? If it is, I take that as a threat until I know otherwise. Right. Because I haven't had good experiences with dogs. So, and I, I've yeah. never in my life called a dog over to me. You know, are missing out on stay, but never stay was. Um, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've helped Mr. Hoffman before when he's come in and mm -hmm. heard the stories. Unfortunately, much like you just said, in, in a couple of occasions when you've had these encounters, you don't know the person and you don't know the yeah. dog, right. which means there, by the time he makes it here, there's not a, a great deal of action that can be taken because I don't know who I'm supposed to call or even, I don't I'll even have a method it. of searching the dog breed, to be mm -hmm. honest with you. Follow them to their car and get their license. 
I know what you're doing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we as the select board have given Tom direction. Yes. Also, yeah. per this draft, he will be the animal control officer. And I do think it's a valid point having also walked on that path a lot. It is a rampant, um, and candidly, it's a lot of folks who live in the area. And we love you very much as manager. Please right, okay. definitely yes. don't leave. But also, Tom spending an afternoon actually writing formal letters to folks and educating them. Yeah. Right. And or us having right. animal control. To me, it's a worthwhile place, at least within the village don't have a dog, I don't know all the walking spots, but it feels like, I know you've said in the past, we've had an animal control officer and they've spent a day there, and <coughs> we've received a lot of then feedback from folks who didn't know there was a leash law and weren't right. happy to get their $50 violation, but I think if we have an interest in doing it, I think it's reasonable for us to say if we have an ordinance and at least a day of public education. Tom, and I just want to say to this gentleman, it sounds like he's had some background here, it sounds like he's an intelligent man and passionate about this, and we do have an open application <laughs> <laughs> job. Oh, your resume would be well received, I'm sure. I mentioned this issue to Bill Shufflock on one of his last days, and he said, we don't have an officer you want to be at. My thought is, I've been a public employee for over 40 years with the state. I think my time in public service is nearing end. I'm gonna, besides, I don't, Deal with animals. I'm not familiar with animals. Yeah. I, I, I don't know if he's well suited for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's that's right. Right. It may not be for you. No. Billy okay. Oh, Billy's a Billy. volunteer. Billy. Oh, yeah. Billy, there's one thing that you have not done yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I told you, I'm not doing it. I am on voluntary moratorium. I think you know. No, I guess. Yes. 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 Really? That was a girl. So why, you know, what was this text was... thing you were doing? Sorry? You, you just said, you got up here and talked about how you were volunteering with the parks. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a legacy. Boy, you're tough. Okay. Okay. Right. It's tough. Right. You were about to say. Anyway, I was going to say, you know, I actually, I was joking around with Karen when I registered my dog. I thought I was the only one who actually bought those licenses. But I wonder if the easiest way to do this is a short third of a page that says when you get your license, you get this piece of paper saying, here are two or three rules, and then everybody can't complain that they don't know about the rules. Oh, so. no, that, and that's fine. That'll go to the 300 people who are following the rules and licensing right. their dogs. 300. 300 okay. people. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see. Uh, it's better than 100. Yeah. 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 So we, we have given Tom his direction, mm -hmm. and it is almost 10.30. Yeah. So you'd like to move forward? I would. Okay. Yes. Let's go. Uh, creation of flood mitigation planning and grant writing position. Tom? Sure. Yes. Yes. So short version is I would need your approval for this. It's a new position. So it's not filling anything existing. Um, really, I, I gave a draft job description. I wrote that up Friday. I'm going to tweak that a little bit, but I think it gives the sentiment. Um, Essentially what I'm looking for, I think, is a barb far mm -hmm. type position. Um, there's, I think we're very likely to be awarded the brick grant, um, which will be in the range of $80,000, I hope, um, which can lead to other flood grant opportunities. Um, I think there's an array of grants out there, and it, it just takes some staff horsepower beyond what we have right now to, to research them all and find and apply. I think once you, get some awards, there's generally the opportunity to offset some administrative expenses there. But I think in general, the, the way to pay for this in the short term is that we had a surplus last year above and beyond the ARPA funds. Um, we'll have some FEMA funds coming in that we're not planned for or budgeted. That's above and beyond our direct cash outlays for FEMA. So I think we can set aside those funds into when I'm proposing basically a new fund for flood mitigation work. And this would be the the personnel and this would be any grants would go into that fund. Um, so it'd be hopefully an ongoing rolling initiative. But I, it, it's a bit, it's a bit hard to forecast in future years how much of that would be taxpayer dollars uh, versus grants because it takes time to engineer this and win the grant awards and it's, it's a bit of a marathon um, to get there. Mm -hmm. So I think there's going to be some some town investment here. Um, that would be required certainly for the first year or so and hopefully over that we can offset some of it um, but i just think we're i think we're at the point where we're going to be missing some opportunities without that additional help yeah 
I support it. Tom was kind enough to speak to the Natural Disaster Preparedness Committee, or those who showed up today. We did mm -hmm. not have a forum um, and speak on this issue. They <coughs> had suggested that maybe this individual would attend the committee meetings. I think that is a great idea in the event that we were to create this position. Mm -hmm. Melissa? I'm just wondering how much FEMA, the first 30th FEMA per town meeting is dedicated to play. So yeah, are we getting another 30 on top of that? So that first 30, um, so the FEMA claim is is not one claim, it's yeah. many components. That 30 was related to the volunteer hours. Okay. Um, but what, what the, the, the money I'm referring to is, is my time to administer the claim that I'm going to be able to seek reimbursement for. That's, that's the very last piece they do, so I don't think we're going to see that money in this calendar year. Um, in fact, I, I think we're going to have to be the bulk of our team in this calendar year. Um, that's just that's just the process. Um, Do you have any um, idea of what yearly salary for this position would be? You know, it's almost it's a position, but it's almost a consultant. Yeah, if you will, um, Barb Farr um, yep. was seventy five an hour. Yeah. Um, so it's um, we we'll try to get less than that, of course. Um, but it's going to be, um, I've, had a, I've had a person I had coffee with who had some interest. I've got a couple other people I want to meet with and I would like to advertise it. And you're asking uh, for a set aside of $100,000? Yep, and I'll report back to you on the, on the finance of that, but probably none of it would be spent in the short term because this is not filled. Right. Well, uh, I think this is an important issue for the town uh, and that uh, we're not going to be able to squeeze uh, more uh, grant writing out of our current staff. Uh, so I think it is a needed position. So I would support it. No entertaining motion. Yes, it doesn't. Uh, I, make a, I make a motion to approve the uh, Advertising for the position of flood mitigation grants manager. Don't we have to create the position? That's just the advertisement. Well, advertising the for, the create, for the for the for the hire, hiring of a flood mitigation grants manager. Okay, but a friendly amendment is uh, also that we set aside the funding to support the hiring of the grants manager. There was no second. Very friendly amendment. Okay. Uh, I'll wait for a second. Second. Okay. And now a friendly amendment. And just yes. Oh, that was a friendly one. Okay. okay. All right. All right. So, um, so that has been added to the uh, motion. Any further discussion? So we're putting 100000 in now in your report regarding if someone's hired, and then we would subsequently budget for the position in future years and hopefully reimburse a portion of that. Yeah. Thanks. Can I just ask what um Barbara Farr, what her annual salary may have been? So I believe she was twenty typically about twenty hours a week. Okay. And then it's a little towards the end. Yes. She used to be the uh, state emergency management, you know, director. Yeah. And she came, you know, she's a Waterbury resident and did fabulous job with us you know you know she really directed us through the, the, the Waterbury big dig yeah and I, I don't think this I think there'd be with this position there'd be some investment up front the person's got to learn the community depending on how well they know already they've got a there's a lot of initial meetings and some background to review um, but after that it's um, to some extent Probably not a lot of hours until that grant opportunity arises, yeah. and then you know, right. and so it could be. I don't view it as 10 20 hours a week set, I view it as uh, hours I work with that person and track closely and, and pre approve. Yeah, so it could be a higher hourly rate for anyone. Yeah, um, okay. Any further discussion? I think trusting your judgment on that 
I will note, I think the remote, I mean, I get it, and I know hiring is hard. I think that upfront community buy-in, per tonight's example, building community buy-in for certain things takes a lot of community <coughs> work, and I just would expect that it will take a fair amount of hours here in Waterbury. Not disputing that there couldn't be parts that could be remote, but I think real success in a job will take a decent amount of in-town time. That's a, that's a great point, and I'm going to make some amendments to that job description. I'll probably email you uh, some changes. Totally. And again, I know, I mean, grants management, like if it's accounting and stuff, I know there's things like that that can be remote, but for some of the bigger stuff. Yep. Yeah, and if they're going to be, yeah, if, if they're going to sit in on uh, natural disaster committee meetings, they should probably tour the town a few times. Yeah. yeah. I think for a tour along the uh, river. Yeah. I was asking tickets on the way. Anyway. Ooh, I'll get, I'll get ooh, could we bonus if there are also water. animal control oh, officers? Oh, I've got to go. Tag that in there. Tag right, that in there. Right. You all been doing all night. It's, it's my first in. one. Okay. Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. And Imhoff has your hand up. Oh, and sorry to pass that before you got to, got to you, but go ahead. Um, well, I'm jumping the gun a bit uh, on your next meeting agenda. Uh, okay, the, let's do it. The noise ordinance has been on your parking lot for two years. This is the third year. We're coming up to the summer season. It gets very noisy some nights, and we don't have Lefty anymore to go around with his noise meter to keep track of particularly um, concerts. Well, like that thing you were talking about earlier on where we has, yeah, that's a good has point. special permits for concerts. So <laughs> I would like you to at least address the noise ordinance. Okay. That's all. Right. Thank you. And do you have specific concerts that are a nuisance to you? Uh, sometimes it's just, sometimes it's concerts in the park. Sometimes it's been um, from the reservoir. You know, they've had a band in there and it's gotten very loud. Uh, sometimes um, it's been any place in town. And sometimes people are having parties. At, there was, well, what started that was my neighbor and I, 11 o'clock at night, there was a party going on at Randall Street that we could hear. And it was going on until, well, it was your neighbor. <laughs> uh, but it was going on until well after 11 o'clock at night. And so, yeah. nothing specific, no specific. But Lefty used to wander around town at night with his noise meter. Mm -hmm. Well, you'll be happy to know, and that. Uh... We're having my birthday party at the Fish and Game Club this time. <laughs> <laughs> we won't be going till 3.30 in the morning this year. Well, it, it was your neighbor. It wasn't you. <laughs> no, you're wrong. But never mind. <laughs> and the reservoir is sticking exclusively to jazz now. Jazz? Yeah. Okay. Jazz. And the rotor is Oh, it must be killing you. Know. Okay. Yeah. All right. Anyways. My neighbor is a nurse who has to be at work at 5 o'clock in the morning. And so, you know, particularly weeknights. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Anna has suggested that we move the noise ordinance up onto the agenda for the. Uh, June 4th agenda. So, we out. don't have a noise ordinance to bring in June. No, but it's a discussion of whether we will First have discussion. One. Yeah, preliminary discussion. Preliminary discussion. 
Okay, sorry. Okay. Fourth and then it's positive and I mean, we could just have someone drive around with an air horn and be louder than the concert. Mm hmm. Or how about that Methodist church thing? That'll drop in not some. But, uh. <laughs> Sure. We're getting late and punchy. Let's do this quickly. I already have covered my face once. Um, I asked for public outreach on the rental register. It's getting late when you're picking on the churches. <laughs> I'm not the first one. There are other people. The, the registry? Um, I said we should talk about public outreach. It doesn't have to be oh, the next okay. meeting. It can be the one after. I'm noting we would have secondary discussions on animal control and housing trust if we think we'll be ready in time, or we can push them one more week. I mean, <coughs> you, you said you were talking to I'll talk to Downstreet. Down Street. I think they could. It's, I think, you know, probably there's five people that work for Downstreet that could tell you exactly what they do and how. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Local funds could augment what they do. I just well, think yeah. it's a matter of are they available at the, for the next meeting. Yeah. yeah. I want to talk to <coughs> folks in the state about their system, too, for incentives, right. mm -hmm. which yeah. don't seem to be terribly effective if those fire marshals shutting down all their ADUs. I say I wish that our state representative was in the room because I will say it's been a subject in the legislature. In, in some of the bills that have increased housing opportunity, they've also increased fire compliance so, so that's something per your point that folks should be aware of in state policy making yeah. we can actually hold our hands up for once but anyway <laughs> um, uh, so follow-up discussion if there's time for that follow-up yeah, discussion on animal control in light of tonight um, mm -hmm. we will have the bylaw hearings question mark if planning commission is meeting I would like we to, would have I would like to wrap that up additional yeah, hearing up. and subsequent adoption of revised bylaw hearings we don't have the planning commission here but yeah let's uh, let's see if uh, the planning commission plans to well, we got one member here um, I don't know what, we were just trying to whisper we don't know what our next meeting is I don't <laughs> oh yeah because it's Memorial other, Day but with Memorial Day and I don't know <coughs> we need to get back to you all right I mean my view is we're not going to be putting a lot of changes in. It's very easy to do what you said. Right. So yeah. we just need to meet. Um, I just don't know when the next meeting is. So can okay. we get back to you on that? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like you don't have me put that on the calendar. Well, we do what we want. Should we do what we want? <laughs> 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 um, you Sorry, know, it's like a 10-minute brief of the OCT thing. It is late. Um, hey, man, we would be calendars just every other week. Um, no, I'm sorry. He had me cancel May 27th. Okay, so let's, I guess we'll have to skip it and put it on the following week if they're not going to be able to meet. As I told you, I probably well, won't be here on the, next, at the uh, next fourth. Weekend. There's going to be dogs in cemeteries no. and five new housing trust funds. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, yes, I'm gonna you be, watch out. I'm going to be on a sailboat in the Adriatic. <laughs> uh, like, All right, let's get this housing trust fund uh, out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Final meeting. Tom and I just wrapped up the VLCT Welcoming and Engaging Communities cohort, and we could give a little tip and break into the team. Get that guy racing down the road. Noise ordinance. Well, listen, I'm sorry, I couldn't yeah. hear you. Yeah. Um, yeah. We can give a welcome to everyone. He likes it. Yeah. Probably the dog. Oh, or All right, we're the dog. <laughs> He's racing down the road. We did it with Rachel. Right. Right. Noise ordinance, um, animal control, yeah. yeah. housing trust. <laughs> <Welcome on. laughs> so, right now, uh, I have. Welcoming. Noise. Uh, I have noise ordinance Before. preliminary discussion, animal control secondary discussion, housing trust secondary discussion. On the June 17th agenda, it sounds like bylaws <coughs> yeah. that gives the planning commission a chance to meet. Yeah. I'll check that date. Um, and then welcoming and engaging communities cohort, which is something me, Tom, and Rachel participated in through the Vermont League of Cities and Town. We can just do like a 10, 15. So just an update? Yeah, update. Okay. Great. Good. Is there, and then you have the items that I've already listed there. Um, the, the hazard mitigation plan public hearing that's Neil that has to be there. Uh, Watering in initiative, excuse me, at 7 15. They got a hold of Roger. <coughs> I think they got a hold of me. And then well, Watering in initiative, that's the land trust. Mm -hmm. um, 
Are you on that? You're on that board. I step down. <laughs> I have enough meetings going to all. So, is the state police contract staying on that one? That, that, yeah, we need to be there. Yeah, yeah we okay. need to talk about it. All right, so you're probably. They, do they have a contract proposal for us? Close to full then. And my yes. last note is it's June 3rd. What is? Oh, Monday. Really? Oh, really? Because I have a work meeting on the 4th, which is a Tuesday. Right, but I need them to meet. And they're not meeting at the end of May, he said. No, I know. No, I'm just no, saying no, this no, said June 4th. It's the wrong day. I think it's oh, the day. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. No, I'm sorry. That was just typographical. Okay, okay. so I have a I typo on the I think it's Monday, yeah. June 3rd, was okay. all I was saying for that. Got it. Thank you. Yep. Sorry. No, that's okay. I, just my mind was elsewhere. Oh, this is Michael staff. It's not It's okay. It's late. But I, What's late. Monday, June 3rd? What is she talking about? My personal one that's like. Might I make one quick suggestion, too? Sure. Parking ordinance has been on the parking lot since well before my time. Mm -hmm. um, two winters now, the only parking complaints I've had have been by a couple people who got towed, um, which happens, I think, anytime you have an ordinance. Um, I'm not sure there's a problem that needs fixing. Oh, I mean, not that you didn't enjoy this, but you know there's a parking ordinance that requires on-street allocated parking spaces that we inherited from the Edward Fry Utility District. So unless we need to formally vote to unadopt that, but as of now, folks who go to the Development Review Board need yes. to prove off-site parking via this bananas mix. So I'm not disagreeing with handling it, but I think there's some conversation there. Okay. Per also, the you know, planning can, commission let's has begin asked the conversation with the old village too. parking ordinance mm -hmm. where we stacked the cars 15 high to get enough parking spaces to permit right. the res. Yeah. So they did something in this rewrite um, around not requiring it, but it is technically still in the book. So we even need to say this is null and void. It's like a weird zombie ordinance okay. right so now. Do they stack? Do they need to actually roll us on top of each other and make waves in the lake? Right. Uh, do we have time to address it? Uh, on uh, Monday the Maybe an initial conversation. Yeah. Oh, initial conversation. Love that. Yeah, we have a limited discussion. Let's stick with the right <laughs> language. Bring up a new, any changes. You're doing a character. You're going to have the old Tory board and someone will go over this. Okay. Okay. That was my, I think, and to be clear, to be clear I think the policy choice might be we just revoke it, but it exists and it's lurking. No parking meters. Parking meters? Okay. All right. We have a parking meter over here. I move to walk. adjourn unless we have executive session. <laughs> Is there Do you need an executive session? I can give a, um, a brief update in open session and since we're not talking about specific numbers. Okay. Great. It's so, not, a, not a secret that the town's interested in buying the standing Watson site. Mm -hmm. It's been discussed very openly. We made an open, we made, a, we made an offer to the state that I won't disclose because that's still private. Um, they have said no to the offer. Um, we're doing a little more legwork, and, and I've reached out to hire an appraiser to get a current number because the current appraisal that the state had done was uh, November of 22. A couple floods have happened since then. The market's a little different. Um, so we're doing a little more research, and we'll come back and I think meet with them pretty soon. They said no. No. Why are so, they making any positions? It was the same. Now. It was the same no that we had uh, from before. Yeah. No. No change. Got it. Just uh, we had a conversation, uh, a very friendly conversation. I thought. Uh, I think that they are willing to move, but they need some paper backup to justify you know, their movement. Okay, uh, so there was a motion to adjourn a second. pending that, and it's been seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 We are adjourned.